is where. Okay, members, just remind you to turn your phones on silent, interferes with the recording equipment. Um, Gen item one is apologies. You know, Raymond was uh, will be a little bit late, but intends to be here. Are there any other apologies from anyone? Nope. Okay. Gen item two is draft minutes of the meeting on the 25th of February. I um, can advise members to uh, look over those minutes, uh, page five to nine of your folders. Right. If you want to look over those, happy enough. Yep. Okay. Uh, agenda item three, matters arising. Uh, only one item is the forward work program for March. And just to advise you, there's been upgraded, oh, updated forward work program for March on pages 11 to 16 of the meeting folder. If you want to just look over that at your leisure. And then we'll move on then to agenda item four, proposals for a firearms licensing phase. Um, department officials will attend the meeting to update the committee on a range of firearms issues, including the current position and changes to the licensing phase and the Minister's proposed way forward in relation to the abandoned system and young shooters. The relevant papers can be found in your packs, page 159 through 200. So whenever we're ready, we'll get the officials in. If you take that there. Mm -hmm. yes, we'll have a look at that, Joe. Good afternoon. Can I welcome Simon Rogers, Deputy Director, Protection and Organised Crime Division, Robert Kidd, Head of Firearms and Explosive Branch, and Donna Gibney, Firearms and Explosives Branch in the Department of Justice, the meeting. Um, be aware it's being hand started and will appear on the website in the course. So, whenever you're ready, if you want to um, open up, and then we'll open up the questions afterwards. Okay, thank you, Chair. Um, we're here today to update the committee on the work we've been undertaking on firearms issues. You have a paper setting out the Minister's views on age for young shooters and the proposal on the banded system and giving an indication where we are on the review of fees. On young shooters, having considered the issues again, the Minister is still of the view that a young person should be of secondary school age to be firing a shotgun, that the appropriate venue is an authorised clay pigeon club and that live quarry should not be involved. It follows that the earliest the Minister believes live quarry should be engaged at 16. The, the Minister believes that young shooters can develop skills with target shooting and clay shooting at regulated authorised clubs up to 16 and that they may shoot live quarry uh, from that age with supervision. In terms of the bans, we have been engaging on the issue for some time. It is fair to say that the Department and the Police um, have had a number of concerns about public safety. Uh, this includes risks around handling transactions and firearms, and firearms being provided for circumstances and for which the original approval would not have been applicable. The important starting point for the debate is that Northern Ireland already has a more flexible regime than seen virtually anywhere in terms of one-on, one-off for shotguns, as well as a same type and calibre scheme. So there is already considerable flexibility. When looking at variations, the current guidelines set out a range of bans which the police will consider. They will ordinarily allow the variation provided good reason exists. We had suggested to the stakeholders that the police would operate a new fast track regime utilising these bans and this would lead in the vast majority of cases to a turnaround in five working days. A number of stakeholders questioned why dealers rather than police could not undertake the exchange. We explained that our licensing system was based on the Chief Constable having responsibility <coughs> and, that he, and that if he is making the decision, then that provides a safeguard. We further explained that were, were the Chief Constable not to be making the decision, we would need to take a more precautionary approach because of the risk of error and inappropriate transactions uh, where there is no good reason. With that in mind, we have worked up with police experts a banded system that is before the committee today. Um, it is a significant uh, move from our previous position um, in that the dealers will lead on the um, ex exchanges. We've excluded certain categories to manage the risk and also to make the system more straightforward for the hundred or so dealers who could operate it. Naturally, we would provide guidance to them if this is the regime we are to follow. 
And it's important to mention that just because a transaction does not fall in a band does not mean that a variation cannot be sought from the Chief Constable. That is the normal route for change in virtually all other jurisdictions. Uh, what we have put on the table is, as far as we can tell, unique. We circulated the proposals on young shooters and bands to our stakeholders and we held a meeting on Monday 23 February to explain them. It is fair to say that some groups have engaged on those proposals and some have not. Of those who have engaged, uh, they have effectively accepted the proposal as set out. Um, there is, of course, uh, a need to work out the detail, for example, around authorisation, but they accepted the proposals as set out. Three groups have written stating they do not accept the proposals. Uh, we've nonetheless invited their comments, but to date have not had any, and we've offered them the opportunity to put in comments at the stage, and we hope they'll take that offer up. I recognise, of course, that all groups wish to see the fee proposal before making final comments, and this is because the fees will be relevant in terms of the cost of an authorisation of a club, the cost of the banded exchange, etc. On fees, following what we felt was a very constructive workshop on 3 December, and naturally with police agreement, we asked Business Consultancy Service and DFP to review a number of police processes um, to ensure that they were efficient and appropriately costed with a view to seeking to drive down costs where possible. That work by BCS is nearing completion, and once received, which we hope is, will be in the next couple of weeks, we will set up a further workshop with the stakeholders and then come back to the committee. At that point, decisions will need to be made on the way forward on the issues. Clearly, some aspects of the proposals would, for example, require legislation, whether primary or secondary. Chair, thanks for the opportunity to give this summary. Okay. Um, you know, obviously, this issue has been rumbling on for a considerable period of time. And the last time I think officials came to the committee was before my time. It, it doesn't appear as if there has been a meeting of minds between the, the key stakeholders and uh, yourselves in terms of the proposals. Would that be fair to say? And I listened to you saying it was a significant move. Those who have engaged um, have effectively accepted. But there are sizable groups who haven't accepted the proposals. Is that right? That is right. Um, the, on both young shooters and bands, a number of the groups who attended, in fact all the groups who attended on the 23rd accepted what we were proposing. Three other groups didn't attend and, and uh, to date do not accept them. Um, now that obviously presents us with a very difficult conundrum. Um, on the one hand, the Minister is clear as to, uh, as to his uh, lines on this issue. On the other, there are issues on which, particularly around the banded system, we would be happy to engage further um, uh, to see if there's any detail or, as we put it in the, the submission to the committee, any tuning we can do. Um, but as you're right to summarise, that we haven't got widespread agreement. Okay. I'll see. Thanks very much, Chair. I'm intrigued by this because th this, has been, this issue has been around for a long time, as you say, and I would have thought the application of minds of people particularly those key stakeholders, and I share their frustration, those who didn't attend, because, frankly, as I look at what the, the initial proposal was for the banding system, which was starting to make sense, there's no doubt about that, and uh, I'll tell you about that, I could see from what limited information and knowledge they have myself that this was making sense. But I have to say, this proposal that you have before makes sense in band one, band two, but absolutely no sense bordering on nonsense in band three, four and five there that has been proposed. So I would like to know what, what has changed between this one, where the original bandings were, and this one. Because to me, it does not make sense. The difference is that the scheme we were proposing for would be managed by the Chief Constable, and therefore if a request came in um, they would use their existing variation bands and would turn the application around, but would be able to look at risks. So, for example, if a firearm being proposed was on loan or actually was not of the calibre within their bands, the Chief Constable could rectify that before a sale is made. There's, so what, what we said at the workshop was if we would go down the route of putting the responsibility in the hands of dealers, 
then we would need to look at a more constricted approach to avoid difficulties. Mr. Chair, with greatest respect, can we avoid just the administrative aspect of it? I want the logic for why it changed. For, I'm not talking about the management of the process. I'm talking about the, the actualities, the realities, why it changed from this to this. Because I simply do not understand these proposed findings, three, four, five, why, why there are three instead of what there were originally and the, the original proposal that they were contained within one band, band C. So I'm trying to stop. What has changed and the others have just disappeared off the list? What has changed practically in terms of the evaluation of those firearms so that they were further added into, instead of being in one band, they were added into uh, three bands and you yourselves have described them, I think, as fox rounds. So I'd just like to know what, what has happened, what has changed well, there. The, the fundamental premise of the law at the minute is that the Chief Constable makes decisions around good reason and therefore decisions rest in his hands. What's on the table now is to say that the Chief Constable no longer has the ability to make a decision up front on, on, on um, an exchange of a firearm. So we have tried to take out of it the corners, if you like, the shadows where there could be difficulties. And I can give you a list of examples of difficulties we've experienced. No, sorry, I'm not looking for difficulties with the greatest respect, Mr. Rogers. I'm looking for the, the logic, the rationale behind the proposal that you moved from band C, one band, to covering these calibres, to splitting it into three different bands. Because you we better shoot myself if you know that. Uh, this doesn't make any sense to me as a practitioner. It simply doesn't make any sense. Well, uh, uh, I'm going to ask Robert to come in the minute who's the guy who's been engaging with the IFEX. And, and the, the thing is you, you would accept, are you saying that this is rubbish then? The, the original proposal uh, uh, that the, there should be the, the band C and that that band, like obviously it was your department drafted up and crafted up these proposals with consultation with stakeholders and working through practitioners and for to produce this which had logic to it, to then split it into, not two, but three even, uh, it, it bears no sense. Um, it's chalk and cheese is the point. One of them is being managed by the Chief Constable, who has statutory responsibility, the other is being managed by a uh, firearms dealer. Um, and, and the second point I'd make is, although some groups don't support uh, the bans as we've labeled them, a number of the other groups that we met on the 23rd did support them. Yes. So. But you haven't answered my question. I'm not talking about the process. I'm talking about the logic for having bands, which there were, there was logic to this, and then to produce new banding. What, what's the basis for, for splitting these into three? The logic in terms of the actual firearm. Yep. Okay. Um, I think the easiest way to explain it, Mr. Rodone, is the second table is not an evolution of the first. The first one was right. by the second table, you mean? The, the later one, the one you are saying. I mean, makes sense with the, the three, four, and five bands. Three, four, and five bands. The first table, as, as Simon has alluded to, was a scheme which was going to be administered by the chief constable. The second scheme is an entirely different proposal based on something which could be administered by firearms dealers. So, so that scheme had to be different, and we had said, we had spoken to stakeholders at the time and said, if the scheme is administered by dealers, it will necessarily have to be tighter because the Chief Constable retains the responsibility around good reason. So, right. Are you telling me that there is no ballistic reason for this? There are ballistic reasons in terms of SIFEX, um, who are the police advisors on ballistics, have advised that if this were going out into the control of firearms dealers or in the hands of firearms dealers, they would want those three bans and they are... Right. Well, there's two things from that and I'd like to put it on record. One is, you seem to be crediting firearms dealers with very little knowledge of firearms. That's the first thing, and I wouldn't like to think that's the case. But the second thing is, um, SAFEX, were they presumably consulted about the first set of proposals? The first set of proposals, yes, they were copied in, but the key information was that in the first instance, right, so the Chief Constable was retaining control. No, no, but sorry, you have to have logic for anything, and it has to be able to be stood over. So, you didn't consult SIFEX about these first set of proposals? The police were consulted. The police were consulted. Um, and you did consult SIFEX on the second set of proposals then, yes. which you yes. have before us. Chair, I think it would be very helpful if we had both those reports before us, mm. um, the, the established reports that inevitably you'll have. 
um, so that we can make considered opinions as to what those are. And I would su suggest to you that um, those form the basis of consultation with the key stakeholders out there. Um, those major shooting organisations who represent the, the larger body of uh, sports people, um, that, that then form the base because they have certain definite expertise in these matters too. And um, there may well be an exchange of views to come to some sort of compromise. But uh, really, um, this, this makes no sense whatsoever to have moved from a position where, where we were making sense in terms of the ballistics and that type of thing to a position of where we, we make no sense at all. The only two bits make sense, the one about their rifles and the rim fires. Uh, but the centre fire stuff makes sense at all. Uh, Chair, so if I could suggest that the committee get copies of both reports, the report about the initial uh, proposals contained in Annex C of the proposed banded system. Uh, this is proposed in reports from police and any expert opinion or statistics or whatever that DOJ uh, uh, has, has obtained. And then secondly, the, the report upon which <coughs> the proposed new bandings has been based. I think that would be very helpful to the committee chair. Okay, thank you. Okay, Sammy. Thank you, Chair, and thank you for your so far. Um, could I ask him about ask Simon? Simon, in terms of the key issues that I've outlined here, in terms of banding, the fee, and young shooters, how does this relate to the rest of the United Kingdom and, in fact, the uh, Republic of Ireland? Um, well, if we take the bands first, the current position, never mind the banded system, is already unique here. Uh, it does not exist elsewhere. Um, and, and that is partly why we're taking a precautionary approach around this uh, and we're moving for a system where the Chief Constable may <coughs> make a decision to agree or not to agree as opposed to a dealer who will make a decision that the change will actually happen. Um, on, on the fees, England and Wales are in introducing um, a fee. Uh, they've done some work around this, including engagement, and their fee at the minute is proposed. £89. Uh, we're doing more work on that. We originally had uh, 121 um, and, and we're doing more work, as I said earlier, to try and see if we can take cost out of it. Um, on the age, uh, in Great Britain, there is no age uh, compared to Northern Ireland um, and in the Republic of Ireland it's 14. So you said the rest of the United Kingdom Well, the rules here, but it's much. There's no age. Yeah. Yeah. And so what they yeah. are, and they're building that as well. Thank you, Chair. And are there any? I mean, are you aware of any issues with the GB system in terms of accidents or incidents involving <coughs> people? And there must be a rationale of why we're we're, we're setting an age limit. The experience of GB, has the experience in GB led the Minister to have that, that view, or what's the, the view of the Minister based on? The, the, we did ask um, the Home Office for statistics on firearms incidents involving young people, which they did give to us, um, but they're not split down into incidents in terms of legally held firearms and other incidents, so we, we couldn't rely on those, and we, and we have never sought to rely on them. The Minister's view is that a person below secondary school age is too young, um, if we're taking an incremental approach to change, is too young, initially at least, to be uh, given a firearm. And he thinks the proportionate step to move to 12 in terms of physical development, etc. Um, he recognises that that isn't the case uh, in target clubs, for example, there's no age limit here, but that's a different <coughs> environment. Um, and he has also proposed as part of the, the package that he would put an enabling provision in and would review this. But he doesn't want, he doesn't feel it's appropriate to go from 16 to naught um, and add a risk. Um, he feels that 12 is a useful staging point. That is what, at meeting of the 23rd, <coughs> the groups present felt was appropriate. And it's what um, the Minister's asked us to bring to the committee. Sure. <coughs> Can we just ask, uh, Simon, when we've been around these issues before, which groups have not engaged with you, and um, have you tried any alternative methods of engagement with them? 
Um, because it seems to me that if, if somebody doesn't wish to engage in the debate, it makes it very difficult, A, for us to assess their, their view, and indeed, perhaps even to take into account their view, uh, if they're not willing, at the very least, to engage with the department. And I'd like to come back to you on the issue of aid. If you could just answer about, first of all, those that aren't engaging with you. Um, I think it's fair to say that all groups engaged in the workshops is the first thing I'd say. We held a couple of workshops at, at, at the tail end of last year. Um, our latest set of proposals, BASC, Gun Trade Guild and Countryside Alliance, have written to say that they don't support them uh, and, and they're not engaging on them. And is the engagement by way of um, consultation, I mean obviously you have made changes and, uh, and therefore that has to have come about, the only way that can have come about is by that, by conversation having taken place. So are they losing out by not having this conversation with you? Well, uh, my view is um, that we're prepared to, as I said in, in the opening remarks, tune the banded system. We're happy to have that engagement. We're happy yes. to hear the views of yes. experts, yes. the dealers. Um, and if they don't have that exchange with us, then we're not in a position to take account of their expert opinion. So for now, we're relying on what other groups have said in the 23rd, yes. who are happy with what we proposed, and the police view, and um, the ministers looked at, at, at that scenario. So it, it would be far better if they did engage with us. Um, um, you know, we're still happy at this stage to have that engagement, but we have moved a long way on this. We have moved from a proposal that said the Chief Constable would um, manage the bans in five days, um, five working days, to now putting the system in the hands of the dealers, which I'm going to repeat is unique. And these are dealers, some of whom will not engage with you in this discussion? Yeah. Just for the record, Chair, I should uh, declare that I am not a holder of a, uh, of a, a, a license uh, area at all. Um, can I then ask you in relation to the age thing? Currently we have an age limit of 16. Um, and you've said that it's difficult to know what the statistics are from the United Kingdom, for the rest of the United Kingdom uh, in respect of accidents and other incidents. But I think any reasonable assessment of moving um, something which is perceived, I think, by the vast majority of the general public, even though well regulated and extremely well supervised, um, from the hands of a 16 year old to somebody who may be 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, 11, is very much uncharted waters, and therefore a reasonable and proportionate. To, uh, <coughs> I think any reasonable person would consider that just to drop it from 16 to zero would be an irresponsible act and one which I don't believe any minister should be expected to stand over. Okay. I don't. Yeah, um, just in the balance first, then I'll come to the young student. If uh, I had a 0.22 Hornet embedded in uh, to a D Swift, which is in a different band, have they use different ammunition, or is it actually the same ammunition they use? Could be the same ammunition. Yeah. This is actually same one calibre of, of, of the weapon. This, this is one of the complexities. Um, there's two bands difference in it. That's right. But there's two bands difference in it. So that moves from three to five. So can you explain why? Firstly, all of, the, all of the categories, six of the eight categories in three, four, and five, are using the same calibre of bullet, but they're in three different bands. One of the issues that has come back is that it's not simply a matter of taking the bullet size from the smallest to the largest. The issue involves both the bullet size, you also have muzzle velocity, you have kinetic energy, um, and a lot of that is determined actually not by the bullet size, but also a combination of the bullet size and the cartridge case capacity. That is basically how much propellant that bullet and the shooters at the table will be aware of that. So you can, and um, I'm sure again some of the shooters will be familiar with the likes of the, the Hornady ballistics tables, which show that for a certain firearm there will be a range of different ammunition types that can be used within that. <coughs> we have taken advice again from PSNI from side effects. There are averages or typical rounds that will be used, but there is quite a degree of variation that is 
possible within those? Well, when you're shooting a rifle, then is it safe to shoot a rifle? That's the decision for the shooter. Yes. But there will always need to be a backdrop. You won't shoot a, a rifle on a plane of land where there is potential for it to travel into something you didn't aim at. Am I right? Yes. So does it matter at that point if you're taking the reasonable precautions and the sensible precautions, does it matter if the bullet's travelling at 60 foot per second or 90 foot per second because you've taken the appropriate precautions? If you haven't taken the appropriate precautions, I don't really want to be hit by a bullet at either 60 foot, foot per second or 90 foot per second. You know, this, this just doesn't actually, as, as Mr. Malone tried to tease out, where is the logic here? I don't see the logic in having weapons which are very similar um, put into three different bands on the basis that you know, the bullets may travel at a different speed depending on the velocity of the Because these are dangerous, dangerous weapons in the first instance that are not handled right. If they're handled right, the power difference doesn't, you know, sh 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 shouldn't apply. Whenever I, I apply for my driving license, that covers me to drive a Lamborghini. It would cover me to drive um, a car which is very low power. So, you know, here we have someone who is either skilled up to actually use a weapon or they're not skilled up to use a weapon, in which case they shouldn't have it at all. And therefore, having the three, you know, all of these weapons which are quite similar, different bands. I'm, I'm with Mr. Midlone struggling to see where the logic is. Well, just, <coughs> pardon me, to answer your, your final point there, Mr. Poots. Um, in terms of someone changing up in a firearm at the moment, if a person makes application to change up in certain firearms, there will be an additional supervisory um, requirement put on them. Mm -hmm. So it's not simply a matter of once you have a firearms license, you have a free entitlement to shoot anything from an air rifle to a deer rifle. Mm -hmm. So that there will be supervisory requirements. So the chief constable at present would see that there is a difference between different calibres of firearms. Yeah. On, on the, the, the young shooters, is, is the pace and I out of step with, with APCO and, and <coughs> anyone else in, in, in GB in terms of where they stand and shooting? Because the APCO chair of the Firearms and Explosive Licensing Working Group suggested that a minimum age limit of 10, um, which is also age of criminal responsibility, Mr. Chairman, uh, is introduced across both types of licensing on the understanding that there will be firstly a new legal requirement that all children are supervised by an adult over the age of 21 who is also a certificate holder. Uh, but he also says it is in the interest of safety, and just quote that, in the interest of safety that a young person who is to handle firearms should be properly taught at a relatively early age. That's, that's the APCO guidelines. I noted in, in the, the document that was sent from the Justice Committee that the Minister feels. So are we going to go on expert evidence or the feelings of the Minister here? Well, I think the Chief Constable has advised the Minister, so he's going on, on the advice of, of the Chief Constable to start with. Um, the Chief Constable disagrees with APCO? Well, the Chief Constable's position is on record, and we've recorded it in all, in all the exchanges with the committee, and then we've published it responses. Um, <coughs> I think one of the things that comes out from that is the need for safety and properly taught, and that is why the Minister is, for example, saying this should be in an authorised environment where there can be proper supervision, close-range supervision. Um, so in that regard, certainly that is, a, a, is on all fours. Um, well, can we get back to where the evidence is here as opposed to people's personal opinion? 42 constabularies in, in, in GB. Are we evidence of there being problems as a result of the system that they, they're actually administering in GB? Well, I'd I answer that in two ways. One is to say that there isn't a record of the injuries. We have a record of injuries, but as I say, it's for all, all incidents. Um, and the second is, in the Republic of Ireland, it's 14. We're not trying to pick and choose a, a jurisdiction here. What we've looked at is what the views are of people on the topic. Some people don't want any change. Um, the, the, the majority of those who commented wanted 
12. Some three groups went for 11 but said it was uh, secondary school age, which it isn't. 11 may not be secondary school age. And, uh, six wanted 10 and two wanted none. So even, even from the evidence from the consultees, we, we wouldn't have the same situation as, as England and Wales. Um, but the Minister has felt that this should be a proportionate move, a uh, precautionary move, if you like, from 16 to 12, but with an enabling provision that if we don't see any negative results, then we'll be able to move further. And is there not a, a, an issue with the firearms? dealer has to actually provide guidance on the handling of weapons whenever that weapon is sold in the first instance? There is, but the, the issue there is a firearms dealer very often will not have a facility to take that person and actually allow them to fire a live round. They will simply be shown, here is a firearm, here is the, the basic operation, and that individual may never actually have discharged a firearm when they take it out of the shop. And, and an issue has been raised with us in the past about whether people before they can take a firearm should have to have some competence test. Now there's mixed views on that in, 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 the, in the different groups as well. How many people were killed in the roads last year? <clears throat> not exactly sure the figure, I think it's, it's somewhere around 80. How many people were killed in firearms incidents involving legally held firearms? And, and that's a good record we want to keep, right. um, and therefore we want to take a precautionary approach to this. Um, and I think it's worth noting... There is that is also the case in England and Wales and Scotland. Yeah. But what I'm saying, Chairman, is that whenever people are handling what they know is a lethal weapon, and it is a lethal weapon, they handle it with care and they handle it with respect. Mm -hmm. And whenever you have the person who's representing all of the, the, the GB constabularies saying that a younger a person can be trained in the handling of such um, lethal weaponry, the better, because they will learn to handle it with the appropriate respect that it requires. And what Mr uh, Rogers and his team hasn't said today, or hasn't provided today, is any evidence base whatsoever just, we have this system, and a lot of it relates back to the troubles. Well, thank goodness there, there's something much more behind us, and we're, we're moving forward now. But we have a, an archaic system which needs to be replaced, and it appears to me that it's being replaced on the basis of feelings. And he says we've made um, considerable steps. I'd say you've made baby steps. Um, we need to see considerable change in these proposals, I think, to, to, to this committee. Yeah, Chair, thank you. <coughs> Thanks for the presentation. Apologies for missing just the first part of it. Uh, and the system, I, I'll not get into in detail. The age of the, the shooters, I, I know I asked the question before, and Chair, you raised it again today about um, the experience in other areas where there is no uh, minimum age. What is the current situation at the moment for uh, rifle clubs? Is there an age limit there at the moment? There's no age limiting in target shooting clubs. There isn't? Yeah. And what your, the proposal in this document, as I read it, is for shotguns, for, I think, the clubs, and it must be a registered club, I noticed, yeah. uh, down to 12, but then for all other shotguns, it's uh, for, for rough shooting or uh, quarry, it's for... Uh, 18 still, is that right? Just, just for clarification. Um, one of the, well, at the 23 um, February meeting, one of the points that the shooters made was um, that uh, at 16 you can use your shotgun for sporting purpose and that, it might, that there was a logic in extending that across all quarry. And although the minister is waiting to hear other views, if any come in, um, he's minded that, that proposal so that from 16 instead of limiting it um, to um, a game, etc., it could be used for any quarry. So um, at the minute, it isn't extended across all quarry. It's, it's sporting unless you're um, uh, living on a farm, etc. Yeah. Um, but the minister is minded to move on that. Okay, but it's not in this 
proposal at the moment? Well, we, not directly. It was only, it was only discussed on the 23rd. Yeah. Okay. Um, because it's, I suppose what concerns me, Chair, is this is another issue that we're saying, you know, may come into the proposals, and I know uh, Mr. Madlone has raised the issues around the, um, the bandit system, and now we have suggested around the age there may be some changes. The fees, there's nothing here. I know there's another workshop planned at some stage I read in the document. Can you enlighten us at all where you are with that? Are you still at 121, or are you coming closer to that 80, was it 89 figure 89. you mentioned earlier, um, or, or where are you? We've tried to do this on a, on a, on a rigorous basis by bringing in um, the FP's consultancy service who look at how much it costs to move a piece of paper or an email, etc. And at the workshop, a number of issues were raised around why is, it looks like mileage has been counted twice, why does the FEO call twice, etc. And uh, BCS have gone out and sat with a number of FEOs and looked at exactly what they're doing with a view to trying to reduce the cost of that element uh, if, if we can. And then there are a number of other issues which you've mentioned around mileage, etc., which we're looking at. So my expectation is that we freeze the fee down, but we don't have the report yet. And, and one report from the FEO <coughs> feeds into the report on the fees at large. Um, we're expecting that in a couple of weeks, couple of weeks. within a couple of weeks, and then we need to take that back out to the stakeholders who raised the issues in the first place to see if that answers the points and then we'll bring it back to the committee. So I, I, I don't know what it'll be, but we have <coughs> sent the team off with a view to trying to you know, identify any surplus costs that could be taken out. And, and already, of course, the costs do not include enforcement or security, etc. Chair, okay. sure, I suppose it annoys me slightly whenever we raised the issue many, many months ago uh, <laughs> that we felt that there, w there were efficiencies within the system that could be found. And the department at that stage were saying absolutely not. Now it appears that they can find efficiencies. Yeah. How long is this going to go on for? Because, you know, I, I know that clubs in particular are keen to get their younger tutors uh, more experienced at an early stage to compete on the, on the world stage. I'm just really wondering how long this is going to go on for, Chair, because, you know, we're back here today. We don't have anything concrete on the fees. We don't have anything, you know, there's still issues around the landing. I think we're probably getting closer on, on the age bracket, but really we need to be trying to draw this to a conclusion. And, and finally, Chair, just a, I'd like to ask, how much of this requires primary legislation, or is there any of it? Um, most of the fees are in secondary legislation. There are a couple of new yeah. fees that were proposed, which therefore need primary. The young shooters would need primary legislation and any change in the banding, um, because it's moving decisions out from the Chief Constable would also require primary legislation. So most, apart from the fee categories that already exist in primary legislation, all the others would require <coughs> primary. Um, okay. So it's going to be a long process still. Mm -hmm. <coughs> Have you any time frame in mind? Well, the, the reality is until we can settle the policy, we can't go near uh, Parliamentary Council or identify a bill. Um, um, obviously you need settled policy first and then you find a legislative slot. Now we are keeping our legislative programme team abreast of where we're at on this. Um, I mean I think the reality is if we haven't resolved it in two or three months we're not going to be looking at election this side or uh, sorry um, legislation Freudian slip this side of the election um, and none of us Wants to be in that situation. We've, you know, I know the committee's invested a lot in this. We've invested a lot <coughs> as well. Some stakeholders have invested a lot, and, and I'd rather see 95% um, of something coming from this than 100% of nothing. And I've said that to the shooting stakeholders. I've said to them, look, at the minute we're at loggerheads, we're achieving nothing. Is there not some way of us coming together and, and moving on on this issue for our mutual benefit? And, and no, that's sure, I agree right. in the sense that you know, 95% is probably better than, than nothing. Depends where the 95% is, <laughs> to be fair, and, and what it's in. But look, can I try to impress, Chair, or maybe you try to impress that I can get the final resolution <coughs> back to the final proposals ASAP, try and progress it. 
Thank you. Thank you, Chair. Uh, can I ask? That, I, I think uh, I'm not too sure of that answer. Can I ask? Are these all dependent on each other? Are the fees, the bandit system, the age of, of minimum age, are they all codependent <coughs> moving forward? In, in one sense, no, they're not. But in another sense, the stakeholders saying, "Well, we want to know what the fee is before we agree um, to a banded system." Uh, we need to know how much an authorisation of a club would be. So in that sense, yes, they are. Could we legislate for fees um, next week? Yes, we could start the process on secondary legislation on fees. So in another sense, they're not dependent. And I, and I think what most people are saying to us is we want to see it all on the table before we give a final um, uh, view. And, and I think that's not unreasonable. Um, uh, the reason I'm being slightly careful about how I put this is some people are saying that's us holding them to hostage. It's not. It's them, them saying to us, we want to see the whole, the whole package. It's not us saying, oh, we couldn't possibly move on bans unless we get the fees. It, it works both ways. Yeah, but, but if, if the department were, were trying to, if you like, stall on one aspect, you, you, you could understand where you could dig a heel in some <coughs> other aspect, which would then delay the whole process. Because you can understand the mechanics of government and legislation means you could go forward, but the practicalities of it and what it looks like in the ground, you can understand why you'd want it all done and the shooters would want it all done together. And when you look, and I know this has been going on, this has been rumbling on for years and years, uh, a way back even maybe even before 2011 maybe, uh, on all these aspects. And what, what I do know and what my experience has been when I've talked to my constituents and to the clubs and the bodies who represent the clubs and shooters and firearms dealers is that the department and more so the PSNI, there has been no human face shown and there has been a, a turning away. Uh, and whilst we can all engage there has been no real meaningful engagement in order to try and get to a resolution on these issues, especially from the PSNI, who seem to have prevaricated every time people have come to the politicians for help, for representation. The police have shied away. The police don't want political interference at any stage, in any way, in any guise, even if it's just us representing our people. How would you counter that? Because it's my experience, as I've seen it, that there has been a lack of engagement, meaningful engagement, by very much so the PSNI, but also by the department themselves. Um, we've never turned down requests for a meeting that I'm aware of. We've had various engagement meetings. The minutes were provided of the workshops. Uh, I think we have had meaningful engagement. Have, have, have we you can, meet, you can meet with anybody you want, and you can sit there, and you can listen, and you can take notes. But you may not act on anything. Well, well, the meeting on the 23rd, every single person in the room on the 23rd was in broad agreement with where we're, with the proposals on the table, number one. Number two, the, the banded system, we could have stuck by our guns and said, no, the chief constable should be dealing with these because he's responsible in our statute for good reason. And we've moved on that. We've moved to a situation where we're putting it to dealers. So, I think it's an unfair accusation to say, A, that we won't engage, or B, we won't listen. It, would be a, it, it is not an unreasonable point that's coming up from this to say this is taking a long time and we accept that. It, it, some of it's quite complicated, some of it coincides with other urgent and important work we're doing, so we have to prioritise it. But we are trying to push this through to a conclusion. You can understand a bandit system that would be left mostly in the hands of the firearms dealers, because you'll be aware of how long PSNI take mm -hmm. to do anything related to firearm certificates and everything including to that. Uh, do you think that's acceptable in the time that PSNI has taken? The uh, fast track system we proposed had a, an undertaking as part of it that the police would take five working days and I don't think that's unreasonable. Um, I, the police are under more pressure now um, in FEB, we know that because of force issues on the police. They, they, all areas in policing are under pressure and, and staff are coming out. Um, so I, um, I don't think it's a fair charge to say that the, the police are taking forever to turn these around. They offered a system that was going to be five days. 
whilst you don't think that's unreasonable, do you think that it's achievable? Because I would be yet to be convinced that the police could turn, the PSNI could turn these things around in five days. Well, that, that, we didn't put that um, proposal forward without talking in detail to the police about that very point. Um, another point we've made to them is the need, um, as we move forward, for the police to be more open about timescales. Um, and I'm uh, under my um, responsibility to access and I it publishes its turnaround times, sometimes warts and all. But with the police, we're saying to them as part of this, if the public are paying for the service, then you need to be <coughs> um, uh, uh, targets, etc. And they, and they accept that. But we're not quite at the point yet where we're funding them to be able to provide the efficient, uh, efficient service. But what happens if uh, the system goes into place in the practice and we find that consistently they fail to deliver on that time commitment? What, what happens then? Well, um, I'm planning for success, hopefully, but if that happens, there are accountability mechanisms such as the policing board. Um, <laughs> you must be joking. Well, you really must be joking. We, we, we have a system in place at the minute that is totally in a, an, inadequately fit. It just does, is not fit for purpose in any shape or form. And, and what you're presenting to us today is better. There's no denying that. It is better. But it is still not there because there are no guarantees that one of the m major stakeholders in all of this, the PSNI, are actually going to, going to deliver for <coughs> once in this area. Uh, and the department could have the best will in the world. But unless they bring the PSNI dragging, <coughs> kicking and screaming, and there's a will there to actually perform to the highest degree on this, you, you're, we're letting the people, the, 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 the constituents, the, the, the shooters, the firearms dealers, the people who this is their business, we're letting these people down. The, the, the irony in that comment is I think that actually the police are performing a good task. I just don't think they're selling it. They're not putting it in the public domain and they should be. Now, I'm not saying in every case things go through quickly. Um, we've had an ACC uh, chief super at the time up in front of the committee before explaining that there are cases where there is information that has to be looked at of a, of a, of a difficult nature. But um, I think the police do want to provide a good service. I think the police do... In, the vast bulk of cases provide a good service, but they may be not showing that. And that is one of the reasons why the department is saying to them they need more transparency about um, turnaround times. And if the public are paying the cost of the service, then they need to account to the public for the service they're provided. And the police accept that. With regards, you mentioned turnaround times. What, what are the police saying about turnaround times? Police turnaround times <coughs> for a typical variation, grant or regrant. Um, my understanding is that the latest figures, which were around about Christmas time, um, was 80% within 10 working days. So the, the big issue then is 20%. How long did they have to wait? Because but I would imagine it is a lot more than 10 working days. The issue there comes into the, the, the circumstances. Obviously, no two applications are identical. Yeah, um, but 20% uh, of the population who are applying for this aren't all going to be uh, people, oh, sorry, who, people sorry, who cannot I'm, get. I'm not alleging or, or suggesting no, no, that no, I would, or, or no. intelligence cases or yeah. security implications. It could be something where there's been a, a medical declaration has changed, so they're having to go for GP reports. Those things will actually impact on police turnaround times and statistics. So the 80 percent that you can do, they can do, sorry, in 10 days, how are they, how are they going to get that massive percentage down? Well, the undertaking on the, the fast track system that we proposed, to, to keep the system very, very simple and straightforward, we said the fast track system will operate where the following terms and conditions apply. So we, we were basically saying this is where it is a straightforward variation. There's no change in medical circumstances. There's no criminal record being disclosed. Um, so you have basically a clean record. What percentage would you reckon that would be? Because it's bound to be less than 80 percent. I, I honestly couldn't even hazard a guess. But the undertaking from the, the PSNI was that for that simple variation process, <coughs> they would turn those around within five days. You're talking about a very small percentage of, of 
applications? I would expect that the majority of, of those applications would fit within those criteria. 80 per cent? I think we're talking about two different things here, <coughs> um, if I may say so. One, one is Robert's talking about the, the now not tabled um, fast track system, and you're, I think, talking more generally about the system, if, if I've if Sorry, I've you, you, uh, excuse my ignorance. No, no, no. no um, I wouldn't be completely want... aware of it. <coughs> And have the same expertise as yourself, so uh, I apologise for that. And uh, it could be the case that we are talking about two different yeah. things. No, sorry, I th I'm confusing things. This was the, the earlier fast track system that was proposed was a guaranteed turnaround time, where it was a simple, straightforward transaction, yeah. and no complexity involving need for medical referees, GP references, etc., etc. Right. And that was what they were putting out. That, that would have been days. that would have been an eligibility criteria, if I can call it that, yes. for the fast track system. Otherwise, yes. it would be into the standard variation system, because. So, the, so what were they producing in the fast track system? What were they coming out with? What working days? It would basically change your firearm within five working days. So that's basically what they're saying they can achieve now. For how many? What percentage of the of applications? The, the 80 per cent figure that I quoted is for all applications? Yes. Yeah, they, yeah. they don't separate out the But, the, but they, they, they could only do that in 10 days. Now they're saying they can do it in five. But the, the, the category that's covered by the fast track is a very narrow area. It's a subset. It's a subset yeah. and it's the most straightforward cases because you've already got a firearm so you should have good reason etc and you're changing yeah. for another firearm. It wouldn't include significant changes between firearms. Um, you know, targets and halt, etc. So, um, slightly different category. Okay, uh, I'll maybe have to look up, read up more on that. Uh, and apologies for that. Can I ask about? Uh, and again, this is something I am not sure of. And that's the bands itself. And, and uh, uh, Mr. Putz alluded to it earlier about the calibers. Uh, am I missing it? There's no nine mil uh, weaponry on this. Handguns are excluded. But why is there a rationale for that? Or the rationale is that the original guidance, which um, set out this first initial table um, on which the parties make decisions, is based on quarry. Yes. Quarry is obviously it's, it's rifles right. for hunting and vermin. Okay. Um, so it really it really is them for the quarry, uh, not for the, the sporting side of things. It's, it's not for target pistol um, or um, dual conditioned weapons. Uh, can I then uh, go on to finally, oh, sorry? Very, finally. very, very finally uh, go on to the age because it is it is very important and again it's the aspect of, of uh, sport hobby or whatever uh, and we are when you look at the UK we are at a disadvantage uh, when it comes to our young sports people uh, and and the, the levels of success that they've been having over in GB uh, for this. Uh, and again, I, I, I want to use sensible language here and all of this, uh, but uh, the Minister thinks secondary school age, uh, mm -hmm. it, it just, it, whilst, whilst, there may, whilst you either go down to the road of there has to be an age or there has to be no age, why if you think that there has to be an age that it's, it's at that 12 years of age? Because There'll be, there'll be young people, it, to me it's not about necessarily about the person who has the weapon in their hand, it's about the supervision they can get when they are holding that weapon. And is that not more important than any age or date of birth of, of the holder? Well, uh, I'm going to take you back again. There are a range of ages that people suggested. The Chief Constable was content with 12. Um, <coughs> Eight of the people consulted, eight of the groups, 12. Three said 11. Those groups said they thought that was secondary school age, as far as I can recall. Six said 10. So th there are different views on what the age should be. The minister wants to take a precautionary approach to this. He said he'll review it. He will, it, it, with the agreement of the assembly and the committee, he would put into the legislation provision to enable us to change the age if, if that was felt appropriate at a later stage. What, 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 uh, what safeguards are there for supervision? No, to me, which is a more important but issue. Because it would be in a regulated club, then you have, in a sense, the best supervision, rather than 
um, a 12-year-old in a field uh, with someone who has not maybe a great deal of experience supervising them and, and, and how do you guarantee that their supervision is co um, effective? And, and we're only talking about target shooting here, aren't we? <coughs> Uh, shotgun used for clay target. Yeah, and, and, and so a young person at 12 won't be able to go shoot quarry? No. Uh, and and why, then, why then is it acceptable to have an age limit of 16 for that then? And, and 12 then for the 16 target? is already a, an age contained within the legislation which enables people to shoot quarry um, as in um, for sporting purposes and um, with supervision. And what the minister has said is, in light of, and you know, the the, the, the uh, points made by a number of the stakeholders, etc., he could understand moving 16 from Bowl, etc., into the broader quarry, so all quarry. Um, now we haven't had all the comments back on the proposals, but he said earlier to Mr. Elliott he was minded to move in that direction. Um, so 16, to answer your question directly, 16 is an age that's already. A, a point yeah. in, in the know. legislation that yeah. exists. Yeah. Okay, thank you, Chair. Go on. It's okay. Uh, my question has been answered just around okay. the fees. Uh, yeah. Chair? Freeland? Uh, just two brief points. I think when Tom was speaking, we had this 95% and 100%. Uh, can that be presented to us? Do we see what the gaps are? Maybe as a paper? Um, I mean, really, the point I'm making is. Um, the Minister has moved on a lot of issues to try and accommodate people. We still haven't bridged the gap. The gap would need to be bridged by moving to possibly 10, um, uh, for example. And, and I think um, on bands, he's moved some distance. And the point I was trying to make was we all need to move, perhaps. And I think you know, the Minister, for example, on 16, is saying I'm prepared to look at that. He said I'm prepared to look at the bands being in the hands of dealers, but in restricted circumstances. And I think the point I'm making is if we can't reach some level of agreement around this issue, it will go nowhere. And that's not a threat, it's no. a statement of fact. And I'd be more no. frustrated than anyone else. <coughs> and, and obviously an update in the fees will, will, will assist us. Yes. Okay. I, I, I mean, in fairness, I don't, you, know, you live in a, a city constituency, you don't get many of these through our office in, in terms of what some of our members have raised. But you know, quite recently, we had a case and and, and then I done a bit of work with some of our people on the policing board. A number of these cases where people appeal the, the decisions have went to court. Mm. And then in the middle of the court case, the PSNI have pulled out in terms of you know the, the, the test around intelligence and the strength of intelligence. And then the license is issued. You know, and it would be an interesting exercise to see the cost of that against you know I mean. And I think that says. You know, this thing around intelligence is difficult to test it, you know, and, and, and for understandable reasons at times, but there are instances where people do challenge intelligence, it goes to court, and then the PSNI relent, and there is expense, and we're having that wider discussion around the cost of legal aid, and, and, and it's those type of cases you're trying to say perhaps shouldn't be happening, and I mean, this get an indication of how many that is. Okay. Those, are, those currently are cases that are the responsibility of the Secretary of State, but we'll certainly yeah. make sure your comments yeah. are passed on to her officials. Okay. Alvin? Uh, thank you very much, uh, Chair, and thank you for your um, contribution to the Committee's uh, deliberations. Uh, just in relation to the, um, the age of a young person, uh, the Minister is proposing 12. Uh, whereas I see from the Countryside Alliance Ireland and the BASC and Gun Trade Northern Ireland Guild that they're prepared to compromise. They were talking about 10, prepared to compromise to 11. Seems to me to be not an unreasonable compromise. But further to that, uh, and, and that relates to a shotgun or, or an air rifle. But further to that, they're saying that the supervision of a person aged, uh, under the supervision of a person aged at least 25 years of age, with at least five years' experience with that particular type of firearm, that seems to me to be actually tightening the supervision aspect, which 
to me as a, as a, a non-practitioner, a non-gunman, perhaps the only <laughs> non-gunman around <laughs> <right here. laughs> uh, it, it seems to me that uh, that element of supervision is absolutely vital, and to tighten that is, is a good thing. And that's, that, it, I mean, it, 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 it's coming... It's coming from the, uh, what I would regard as the experts in terms of uh, the uh, stakeholders in, in this particular argument. The, the supervision element was one of the uh, very constructive, positive points that came out of the workshop. Yes. Um, and, and for example, were the minister looking at moving 16 with all um, quarry? <coughs> be reflecting that going forward? Um, at the minute, that wouldn't apply. It would be a, yes. a much lower threshold of supervision. Yes. Um, and, and the logic behind the move is that obviously, at 25, five years, you've been through one renewal of your firearm certificate, yes. and that is positive. Um, I, I mean, against that, um, you might renew your firearm certificate but not use your firearm very often. So there is a, you know, all these <coughs> things are the shades on them. Um, yes. But we welcomed it. We think it's a good constructive suggestion, and certainly. Um, and looking at 16-year-olds, it's something we... But, but, but it's indicative of a frame of mind. These people are, are, are um, serious in terms of trying to compromise and move this issue forward, isn't that right? Um, and then uh, also they talk about, uh, instead of um, uh, clay targets or paper targets, uh, live quarry and vermin, is that not uh, a reasonable suggestion? to include uh, vermin and, and uh, live quarry? Um, well, our view is that 16 um, would be a suitable age for that. Um, yeah. um, and of the groups we met on the 23rd, <coughs> were content with the proposals, uh, subject to said fee things, but they were content with the proposals we put before them. Just, just well, well, on that, that sorry, on the 23rd, the, the three key stakeholders weren't there, is that right? That's right. I wouldn't call them the three key stakeholders. I would say three, three, three of. Three of. Three of. Yeah. Yeah. Um, I mean, the other organisations have 40-plus um, trade members and things, so uh, th th there's you know, quite a... Um, but it, 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 I, I'm not trying to rank them. I'm just saying there are a number of important groups on the 23rd, and I said earlier a number of important groups weren't there, and we'd rather engage with them, but I, I wouldn't want to diminish the role of the... Of these Present. three, yes. Or, or yeah. any of them. Or, or, or other people that... Yeah. Yeah. But uh, it just seems to me that um, even if they are uh, a little <coughs> bit out of step with some other uh, stakeholders, they seem to me to be working towards a reasonable compromise in relation to these issues. And uh, just listening to the arguments around the table, I think that that's a very, very positive step. Mm. Can I just come in there as well, Mr. McGuinness? Um, in the we had, a, we had a workshop, an all-day workshop, on the 29th of September. Um, we had a we had a half day on the banded system and a half day on on the young shooters. One of the issues that came up, we actually had a, a very uh, thought-provoking discussion. I thought um, we were talking about young people and shooting live quarry, shooting over the fields, over rough ground. And one of the the issues that was raised actually by some of the, the stakeholders was about supervising a young person. If you're supervising someone on a target range or on a, a clay target club range, you're basically standing very close to the person. Yes. Yeah. Um, over the fields, obviously, it's much more difficult to police. And if the young person starts to wander off, you know, even five metres, ten metres from you, are you still technically supervising them? Yeah. Because you can't put your hand on their shoulder and say, hold on a minute, stop there. Um, so there is potential issues and concerns, I think, certainly in terms of safety for the individual, obviously safety for the, the wider public. Yeah. That young person is, is shooting over the fields and over rough ground. Um, Sorry, Chair, Chair, you can make it a standard operating procedure that that would be supervision and that would right. be conducted well. safely. So it, 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 the quality of this evidence is, is so poor, Mr. Chairman. Um, it's hugely disappointing that people just come and make bold statements without there being any evidence base whatsoever. And if that's, that's why we're going forward with the Department of Justice, I'm afraid we're not going to make much progress here today. Sorry, Mr. Pooch, I'm just quoting something that was said at the workshop by a stakeholder. I'm but you're suggesting we have half the department. Don't put everybody around the table here. I'll tell them either. Patsy, then, they won't have one final point at the end. I'm picking up on that one. 
you could equally flip that one right around to say that you have a target range where there are numerous people about rather than an open field where there's nobody else about. So you, you can flip this argument whichever way you want to. You know, um, but there are a number of, just to get down to the, the issues around engagement that Mr Dixon based on, maybe wasn't aware of this, that the, the organisations, and I'm sure you'd be the first to accept that, have been engaged fully with the department on numerous occasions, those who weren't there last Friday. I think they, uh, I could have been there previously on Friday, which was, I hope, not a tick box exercise before the arrival. Um, I could have been there too, but I looked at the proposal and I said, that's a waste of my time going, taking my day to go up there and, and look at something which is minuscule. Now, just, you mentioned that the, the flexible nature of this regime <coughs> is proposed. Um, I think it has to be set in context. In GB, <coughs> you get a shotgun certificate, you can have any number of shotguns on your shotgun certificate. And that's not the firearm certificate. In terms of the practicality of working with the firearm certificate, you establish the need for the firearm certificate. It's sent out to you. The details of that firearm are within seven days sent along to the local constabulary. So just so that people aren't working on somewhere. The, one of the stakeholders that you had there were clearly the deer shooters. Now, the deer shooters won't necessarily be interested in this. They're other quarry shooters of the banding. They're interested in either 243 or 308. That'll be it, period, full stop. The, um, the, the ballistics issue, I could take your ballistics issue, Mr. Kidd, and turn it around within this here. I can say all of those bullets are 224 two, bar the 17 Remington and the, the 204. And I can take the 204 and say, 17 Remington is going out the bar at, at 4,000 odd feet per second, and the 204 is going out at 4,500 feet per second. And yet, with all the 22250s going out at about 2,700 feet per second. So, you, you can use whatever you like in this argument. I think at the end of the day, Mr. Putz correctly said, we need to see, and I presume there is a report from SAFEX. Yes? Uh, a written report? Yes? There are comments, uh, I think, on the initial one came back through PSNI. Sorry, but there is a written report in both these, both these banding systems. There is from PSNA. Sorry, is there a report from both of them on this proposed banded system and your proposed banded system? You've worked on evidence and research, I presume. We've had exchanges with SIFEX which have led to those. Sorry, I Mr. Mr. Rogers, with the greatest of respect, an exchange could be a chat in a corridor or it could be some a detailed document of 20, 30, 40, or 100 pages. Which, which is it? I, I was trying to go on to say that we don't have a document of 20, 30, 40, or 100 bill. We've had exchanges with them, and we've had the existing banded system, and we've worked through it with them to look at how those might be applied in a new regime. Yeah. And, and, and have... Sorry, uh, is there research which supports this banding from AFEX? There are exchanges with SIFEX. That, that wasn't what I was asking you. Is there research which is evidence based from SIFEX which supports your proposed banding? I'm not sure what you mean by research. What I'm saying. Well, I think research means evidence which is grounded in fact and grounded in science. Yes, we, we exchange it with SIFEX on the basis of what would be a safe set of bands to come up with, as we've been discussing earlier, you could cut these bands in different ways, so there isn't a scientific way of doing it, but we wanted to have a set of bands which were safe, uh, um, uh, looking at them across the, the bands using the original proposal, but trimming it because of the difficulties that we could have with yeah. With greatest respect, I find that unusual um, for your admission that there isn't a scientific way of doing that. Um, you're not saying that SAFEX have approached this in a non-scientific way, I hope. What, what I'm saying is, there, what I was trying to say was, there are different ways of looking at it. For example, one approach is to say it's on the basis of the type of um, bullet, but that is not how it was done. Um, it, it was done in a different way. And we can certainly give you details of what our exchanges were with IFEC. I think we would really need that because be honest with you, it re isn't really stacking up, but with the greatest respect to you, know, you're trying to do your job under political direction here, mm -hmm. but it isn't really stacking up. Um, so, so, Chair, uh, thanks very much for that. Thank you. Okay, thank you, members. I suspect we'll be hearing from you on this issue again. <laughs> hopefully, hopefully we'll be soon. The next time. Mm -hmm. Thank you very much. Thanks.
Okay, members. So uh, I don't think it will be a stab in the dark to say that there is a general dissatisfaction in terms of, of where we are at the moment. Um, in terms of what we what we do next, um, there's a number of, of suggestions. Patsy had asked for um, a copy of the, the uh, report or exchanges or whatever have gone. That would be, be, would be useful. Um, any other suggestions in terms of how we take this forward, or I think what members would like to do? If there is one, I'm not sure if there is one, but if we could get a copy of the, the full report and any uh, detailed exchanges between the department or firearms license and branch on this particular issue and specs, because it's, um, it's really not stuck at the moment. There, there, is a, there is a body here that's not represented, and that's the PSNI in regards to this. Uh, and to me, they are as much a problem as anything. Uh, but you know, we, we shouldn't say that there hasn't been movement. There has been progress. Again, very slow. And again, with that progress, there has been no justification in any scientific term. Really, Paul, it has gone backwards from their yeah. original proposals. Yeah. No. Um. I was just going to ask you in terms of the whole process of this and time skills. Um, but. Uh, uh, um, I may be totally wrong, but is there a danger that we could end up just what we have at the moment, and there's no progress um, whatsoever? So we lose everything, you know, in terms yeah. of the, 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 the progress. Is there a real, real danger of that? Yeah. yeah. You could also amend the justice bill. Yep. With all of us, and sort it out. And if the department, the message needs to go to the department. If they're not taking this seriously, if they're not going to engage with this committee seriously, and they're not listening to a community that are safely operating uh, the use of lethal weaponry, then you know, that's something that committee members will have to, to bear in mind, or the committee itself bear in mind, that we could resolve this and resolve it relatively quickly, because they're going to have to go back to do legislation in any event. Tom? Chairs, Justin, I should have declared an interest as a uh, firearms certificate holder, but uh, not that it was necessary, but I'm just concerned, uh, like Sammy, that you know the thing is rolling on. It's been rolling on since May 2012. Can I ask that that we try and impress upon them and, and even bring back some sort of a tableted form that Ruin McCartney was suggesting, the deputy chair, of where the gaps are now, where where they started, how close they have come on the issues, and how close they are to the to the or organisations? Because they said today some organisations seem to be. Broadly supporting, I don't know whether they're definitively supporting what yeah. proposals we're bringing. Some organisations are not, and it might be useful if we had a tablet form in the very near future to try and get progress in this. Otherwise, we're going to, as Tommy says, we're probably going to lose everything. Yeah, and on that issue, because that is a real threat and a reality that, that they could use for this to this co committee. I, I would go along with what Edwin has said that we make it very clear to the department that if they don't come forthwith. We will then look to amend the Justice Bill. Okay, okay, okay. members. Thanks, Chair. We'll move on to Agenda Item 4 then. Um, <coughs> this is from the Prison Service. We'll attend the meeting to update the Committee on the Delivery of the Prison Reform Programme and the Prison Estate Strategy. Also, be an opportunity to discuss other prison issues, including recent correspondence around the procurement of drug testing in Northern Ireland prisons, the findings of the Criminal Justice Inspection Report and unannounced inspection of McGilligan Prison, and recent incidents at McGabry as well. <coughs> The relevant papers can be found in your packs, pages 19 through to 155 of your folder. So, whenever we're ready, if we can bring the uh, witnesses in. Everyone, can I welcome Sue McAllister, the Director General, Mark Adam, Director of HR and Corporate Services, Paul Cockwell, Director of Offender Policy and Operations, and Max Murray, Director of Estates in the Prison Service. Um, just advise you that Ansar will be recording this and will be on the uh, website for the course. So, whenever you're ready, if you want to brief the committee, and then we'll open up to questions afterwards. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. And thank you for your welcome. We are grateful for the opportunity to brief you today. Members had requested an update on the reform programme and, in particular, the plans to develop the prison estate. 
Well, I will provide that for you. We are, of course, happy to discuss any questions you may have on any wider prison issues. You'll be aware this year is the final year of the formal reform programme for the prison service. However, we have said that change and reform will always be part of our prisons. We are clear. We see this as the end of the beginning and not the beginning of the end. Good progress continues to be made against the extensive programme of end-to-end -end transformational reform, guided by the 40 recommendations made by the Prison Review Team. The Prison Review Oversight Group has now considered 37 of the 40 recommendations, with 20 of the recommendations signed off by the group. A further 11 have been referred to the Criminal Justice Inspectorate, and six more health-related recommendations have been referred to RQIA for independent assessment. A more substantive and detailed update on reform will be provided to the committee following the Oversight Group's final meeting in September. On the prison estate, the committee will be aware that development of the prison estate was highlighted as a priority of the prison review team. Being candid, much of our current infrastructure is outdated and inefficient. This means each of our prisons requires substantial and continuous investment over the next 10 years to ensure we have a service which is effective, efficient and sustainable. We know what is needed and our estates programme team, led by Max, has developed detailed plans for each of the prisons. These plans will deliver an improved working environment for our staff. They will also mean our utilities will be much more efficient and most importantly they deliver better outcomes for prisoners. The need for a modernised prison estate is also evidenced by various independent <coughs> reports. For example, you will have seen the recent report by the Criminal Justice Inspectorate and Her Majesty's Inspector of Prisons on McGilligan, which underlined the need to address the issues with its buildings and overall infrastructure. Following the publication of the NIPS Estate Strategy in 2012, the Minister addressed the Assembly and confirmed that he was committed to the redevelopment of McGilligan on the existing site, the building of a new women's facility separate to the existing Young Offenders Centre, the building of a 360 block at Magabry. In addition, the Minister also highlighted the need to bring forward options to develop the high security facility at Magabry, as well as a new prison visits area. Each of these projects is a priority, and we have set out in your briefing the reasons why they must be progressed. Given the historic capital underinvestment in prisons and taking account of the need to provide modern, fit-for-purpose facilities for adult male and female prisoners, doing nothing is not an option. The 360 block at Magabry will go out to tender shortly and a number of construction companies have already lodged their interest to construct this. That block will include 360 cells, each built to modern standards and comprising anti-ligature design and furniture. In addition, the block which will manage remand prisoners will also have a support wing which will include learning and skills and resettlement facilities as well as healthcare and a high dependency unit for exceptionally vulnerable or dangerous individuals. Adjacent to the 360 block will be a new visits area which will manage visits for all prisoners at Magabry. This will replace the existing visits facility which has been in operation since the prison opened in 1986. This has significant limitations given it was originally designed to manage 432 prisoners where Magabry routinely manages in excess of 1,000 prisoners daily. The new block will have enhanced surveillance and search facilities to better manage the smuggling of contraband through visits, particularly drugs. The new facility will also be significantly more staff efficient with good lines of sight to observe prisoners and their visitors. The final part of the work to redevelop Magabry is the high security facility. As the prison review team recognised, Magabry is managed to the highest security standards across the whole prison. The intention is to have the appropriate security measures in place to manage those prisoners who require the highest security allowing the rest of the prison to develop security and regime arrangements which are proportionate for lower risk prisoners. 
On McGilligan, you will have seen the need for particular investment in McGilligan Prison when, when some of you visited last year. There has been very limited development since the prison was first occupied back in the early 70s, and the only modern building there is Halwood House. The remainder of the prison still relies largely on temporary accommodation, including Nissan huts and outdated H-blocks. Of particular concern is the deteriorating infrastructure at McGilligan, where there is an absolute need to spend capital now to upgrade security systems and replace existing infrastructure, including underground pipe work, sewers, security fences, electronic systems and lighting. NIPS has prioritised capital expenditure on other sites in reference to McGilligan on the understanding that McGilligan would be redeveloped. If that is not now forthcoming, then we will have no option but to upgrade existing systems and infrastructure, which ultimately could create significant expenditure as we await a decision on the rebuild. It is also important to emphasise that McGilligan needs a complete rebuild, and simply replacing H-blocks or temporary residential accommodation would not address concerns in relation to the remaining infrastructure or other temporary buildings which are at the end of their lifespan. The decision to maintain a prison at McGilligan was widely welcomed across political, civic and community circles. If we are to realise that long-term commitment, then we must be able to progress the long overdue rebuild. On our women's facility, everyone agrees that having women prisoners co-located with young offenders at Hyde Bank is not an acceptable long-term solution. The Minister has highlighted on a number of occasions that he is committed to a new separate female facility at Hyde Bank. The proposed new facility will address the lack of activity provision for women and the need to have support services for women, including those for domestic violence, mental health <coughs> and addictions. The existing accommodation places unnecessary limitations on the level of intervention that can be provided to women and their families. This project is a priority for our service. In conclusion, developing the prison estate is a critical part of our work. Implementing the estate strategy will ensure that the prison service is properly equipped to manage those prisoners sent to custody, irrespective of their gender, age or background. It is critical that whilst in custody we provide every support to help individuals address their offending behaviour and prepare them for release into the community. Over and above the need to provide direct services and support to prisoners is the need to manage an efficient service. The existing sprawling establishments, the antiquated buildings and the absence of modern amenities create an estate which is expensive to staff, maintain and operate. As the senior leaders of this service, we are acutely aware that upgrading and building new prisons is not always popular and is sometimes not seen as a priority. We understand our building projects are seen as being in competition with schools and hospitals. However, we are planning for sustainable, efficient and effective prisons which will serve our community for the next 50 years. That is how we play our part in building a safer Northern Ireland. Finally, I would like to say something on the ongoing challenges at Row House in Magabra. The committee will be aware that this is a sensitive issue and a challenging environment for our staff to work. The incident on the 2nd of February demonstrated that our staff will respond professionally and effectively as required, and I want to thank everyone involved for bringing this incident to a satisfactory conclusion. You will also be aware of an incident outside the prison during a protest where a member of our staff was placed in a very difficult situation. I want to reassure this committee that we have discussed this with senior colleagues in the PSNI to learn any lessons from that. It is important to say that most prisoners observe prison rules and have good relationships with our staff. The values of the prison service are based on decency and respect. There are a small number of prisoners who do not treat our staff with respect or decency. And when we are faced with such behaviours, it is our values and professionalism which prevail. The work of the independent assessors team is very important, and their stock take report offered a way to normalise the regime at Row House while maintaining the security that people would expect. I believe that report still offers a way to end the tensions that exist in parts of Row House. The prison service is ready to move forward with the independently chaired prisoner forum. However, it is up to the prisoners whether they want to take part. 
that is the way forward. Thank you for giving us the opportunity to speak today and we would now welcome any questions you have on any of the issues that I have raised or indeed on any other area of our work. Okay, well, thank you for that and thank you for your willingness to answer questions on, on wider issues. If I can start off, you talked about having an effective uh, and sustainable service and clearly uh, that includes uh, the staffing levels. And I asked the, the Minister um, about a month ago in terms of the number of prison officers leaving the service. 2010, we had 63 leaving with uh, no new uh, prison officers recruited. 2011, 47 left with nobody recruited. 2012, 257 left with 140 recruited. 2013, 323 left, 170 recruited. Uh, 2014, 104 left the service, nobody was recruited. And up until the, the end of, of January this year, nine uh, people left with, with none recruited. Clearly there is an issue around capacity here, and, and can I ask you, at the present time, how understaffed do you feel that you are within the prison service? Well, I'll ask Mark to talk about the detail of the numbers, but just to reassure you that we are now about to start a recruitment exercise which will allow us to replace um, those, off, those posts that are currently vacant. So we are committed and are now um, in agreement that we do need to recruit. So that exercise has started. We have pressed the button and we will be... Um, bringing new staff in very soon. But in response to your question, um, Chairman, about specific numbers, I'll ask Mark if he might answer that. Yeah, no, happy to. Um, we're about 80 below our target staff and everyone's right the way across all of our, our prisons. And there is a reprofiling exercise that will adjust that slightly as, as the year goes on. And we're starting to begin recruiting now and we'll be bringing in two or three intakes throughout the year. And we will up to um, whatever the recruitment goes out week after next, um, so we'll have people coming in through the early part of the summer and then again in the autumn. It's important to note that where there is a structural deficit in terms of the number of staff, overtime is available yes. to, to fund that gap in full. I think that's a very important point. So although we may be have, have staff fewer than our funded staffing figure, the salaries that we're not paying to those staff is available in overtime, so we can actually um, bring that, that back up to the required level. The figures that I had been shown indicated it was up to 130 officers short rather than 80. Uh, eight, eight, I think the exact number is 86. Um, we can come back we will to check you in writing and come back to you. Bits, yeah. And you'll be confident you have the budget in place to be able to recruit. We've already achieved that to be able to fill up to the tips. Um, so the rest of nine and a half thousand hours of overtime. Yeah. The rest. Well, one of the other issues that I asked the Minister about previously, I got figures for the last three months of 2014, was the number of lockdowns in, in Magabri. October there was 28, November there were 50, and December went up to 151 lockdowns. Some of these may be due with prisoner behaviour, but my understanding is many of those were to do with staff shortages in Magabri. Can you give us a breakdown of how many of the lockdowns, if you have figures in front of you, were to do were as a direct result of, of staff shortages? Well, I'll ask Paul to, to talk a bit in detail about the lockdowns, but just to say that we are being very clear now about when we are talking about a lockdown and when are we talking about a restricted regime. So. When people talk about lockdowns, um, they sometimes mean a restricted regime where prisoners still have access to exercise, to showers, to phones, to visits and so on. Um, we, we have been required to restrict the regime um, in some circumstances at the Gabri um, because of very high sickness levels and um, sometimes because of unforeseen pressures such as emergency admissions to hospital and so on. But Paul might want to just say a little bit more about that. In truth... Virtually all of those lockdowns that we've referred to would have been because of staffing shortages. That we consider that we don't have enough staff to run the safe regime we want to run, to run in all landings. But I'd like to contextualise that. 151 lockdowns um, re reflects 151 landings being locked down at any one time. If, if you look at how many landings there are in Magabri, my last count, I, th I think there were 51. Um, and multiply that by the days and the month. That actually means that the lockdown figure is less than 3%. So at any one time, 97% of the prisoners will become locked down. You talk about a safe regime, uh, and obviously if there are shortages in staff or a particular day there's a shortage of staff, that puts those staff members under, under a threat or, or danger. 
McGabry is a very complex prison. We, we all understand that. There are different categories of prisoner. What are the, the ratios that are required for safe regime to operate, particularly in the, in the category A prisoners, category 1 prisoners? What is a safe ratio between prison officer and prisoner? I, uh, Paul will want to say something about this, but I have always said, always said that I think uh, talking about staff prisoner ratios is not particularly helpful to us because that ignores for example, what activity those prisoners are engaged in, what any dynamic risk assessment tells us about the mood of the prison. So what we prefer to do is to have a process of risk assessing particular areas and particular groups of prisoners, prisoners that make sure that we always have the right number of staff to supervise those prisoners safely, um, given that prisoners will be engaged in a range of different activities. So, for example, if you're talking about prisoners on an enclosed exercise yard in the fresh air, you would expect a much higher number of prisoners to be able to, um, to, to do, partake in that activity safely. Whereas if you have a smaller number in a workshop where you've got tools, that would be um, a different um, a different scenario. So, so for prison officers going out on their landing, so the landing yes. is full, what is well, the safe ratio again, for prisoners on landing? Again, I'm, I'm, I'm not avoiding your question, but that would also um, depend on the design of the building, so what are the lines of sight, <coughs> what is the response should anything happen, or how close by are other um, prison staff, and what is the assessment of our staff, who are very professional at assessing these things in a dynamic way, um, as to the mood of the, the, the prisoners and the um, the likelihood of anything untoward occurring. Paul, do you want to add anything? No, well, I would echo that. The important factors to bear in mind are that every work area in the prison has a <coughs> risk assessment in place. So there is a work area risk assessment, and alongside that work area risk assessment um, is a document called a regime delivery quota. Now, that's, that's um, if you like, the doctrine for how the prison will safely manage if it doesn't have at what it considers to be the safe resources for the full range of activities to be run that day. And it guides managers as to how they should react, how they should adjust the regime, what precautions can be taken. <coughs> if you're looking at ratios per se, we, we don't have an arbitrary ratio that says 25 to 1. and We've not followed organisations that have gone that way. We prefer to be sympathetic to the local information. But if you're looking at the workforce ratios, number of prison officers to number of prisoners, I can tell you across the, the Euro prison network, only Sweden, Norway and the Republic of Ireland um, have more preferential ratios with um, fewer prisoners unlocked, numbers of staff, which says that, that in terms of uh, resource, Ips is still at the upper end of the Euro prison network. I, mean, I, I take the point in terms of, of different areas of the prison, there will be different necessities there, although I do find it extraordinary that there is no guidance in terms of a escape ratio on a landing, because I've spoken to a number of prison officers in the last number of weeks who feel that because of the low levels of staff, they are put in very dangerous positions and they don't have enough members of staff on a landing at any one particular time and it puts them in danger. So I do find it extraordinary <coughs> that there is no guidance there that even prison officers themselves would be aware of in terms of what is a safe yeah. ratio to prisoner in terms of those extreme, you know, extremely dangerous situations, right? I mean, I, I, I absolutely take your point, but I think we've said before, um, between us, we have a considerable number of years, probably about 100 years between us of working in prisons, and, 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 and we're absolutely clear that ratios are not helpful. Risk assessments and regime delivery quotas are helpful to us, and that's what we prefer to do. We can't lose sight of the fact that our bear estate is not large. We don't have separate prisoners, prisons for Category A, Category B, Category C, and open conditions. So you will have a mixed economy of prisoners. Um, I, I couldn't possibly put in a ratio, an arbitrary ratio that's fixed. It doesn't reflect the fact that I might have 25 prisoners in an area who would all be suitable for open conditions. Uh, Let me just ask two more questions before I open up. In terms of, of staff satisfaction, are you... Do you conduct staff satisfaction surveys? And if you do, in the most recent staff satisfaction survey, what sort of level are we at? Yes, we do. Um, and, and Mark can talk about the detail. We have to use the um, same survey as the rest of the civil service. We are obliged to do that because we are part of the civil service. And sometimes we would prefer to ask questions that were perhaps more geared to the 
unique nature of our work, but we, we, we're not allowed to do that. I think we're allowed to put a couple of questions in that are, questions that are, are, are particular to, to prisons, but the rest of the time we ask the same questions as, as people who work in the Vehicle Licensing Agency or in DARD or in education. Um, Mark, do you want to say a bit about our results? Yeah, yeah um, <coughs> I will not go try and paint a positive picture, I think, because um, most of the questions that we get um, we will not perform well against because they ask questions about how much flexibility do you have about, around your day, um, can you come and go from your workstation as you please for a majority of civil servants. That's a lot more flexible than it is for our staff, so we perform very, very badly in, in those spaces. Um, the last survey that was conducted was right in the middle of our exit period. So people were very dissatisfied with um, the, uh, well noted how long um, it took for us to achieve that exit um, process and how dissatisfying that was for staff going through that. Um, so we haven't got a high baseline um, in terms of that satisfaction. We have been putting in place um, work around an engagement plan, we go out and do frontline forums and talk to staff and we do think there's a turn now in terms of that attitude for staff but we haven't got a baseline um, of where people are going and moving forward other than <coughs> very restricted in their jobs from having the flexibility um, and that comes through and that adds to the pressure that they're under um, compared to the rest of the baseline in that survey where people come and go leave early if they need to leave early um, time to set start and finish time and all of those kinds of things without our staff having to manage that within their yeah. regime and we don't perform well. I'll say from speaking to <coughs> prison officers the last number of weeks I haven't detected any upturn in terms of satisfaction but it's hard to, to base that in the nice room. Uh, okay. uh, and we don't have a survey yet. To. Just finally and I know that there was a discussion uh, on, the, uh, on the radio around lunchtime on the issue of, of drugs within prisons, come up, uh, and both the issue of illegal drugs that are in our prisons, but also prescribed drugs, and um, how they're being used as, as, as bargaining chips or uh, prisoners are, are swapping prescription drugs. The CGI report in McGilligan highlighted the, that levels of drug use were high and there were no disciplinary consequences, very positive test result. Why is that? Why is no action taken against a prisoner found with illegal drugs in their system? Well, it absolutely is. We uh, have acted upon a situation that we found to pertain in McGilligan, and now prisoners do face disciplinary sanctions and indeed are, are often referred to the PSNI um, where, where we find drugs. So we should say that drugs are prevalent in our society. We are part of that society. In many ways, we're a concentration of what exists in society. So it is a very challenging area of our work, but we are taking it um, very seriously, we give it a high priority. So we're doing work to challenge when we find drugs. Our intelligence-led searching means we find more of those drugs. We know from talking to prisoners <coughs> that they find it more difficult to, to find drugs in the prison because we're getting better at, um, at, at seeking them out. But we are doing a number of other things. Paul, you might want to talk about just some of the other building work and the, the configuration that we're doing to make it more difficult. Yeah, I'm doing we're not complacent over drugs, but Gilligan's actually a success story if you look at how um, the drug rates have reduced by two-thirds over the last year. But in, in other areas, we know we have much more work to do, and if you're looking at McGavery, these are hard times in terms of getting capital, but the money has been found to upgrade the staff search facility and to upgrade the search facility that exists actually outside the prison, as well as a corporate um, yeah. piece of work to, to produce a new drug strategy for NIPS. In terms of the prescription drugs that the prisoners will have, is there any changes there in terms of how that's regulated or how access to their drugs is restricted so that it can't be used as a, as a bordering tool? Well, yes, we have worked with the South Eastern Trust. As you know, they deliver health care, so they're responsible for the management of medication. We've put in place for some prisoners something which we uh, call supervised swallow, which means prisoners have a nurse standing over them, watching them take the medication, and in some cases that will be liquid medication so that they can't regurgitate tablets. But that is very expensive for the trust to provide nurses to do that. Nurses do not see that as a real use of their skills and qualifications, so that makes it very difficult for us to attract, or for the trust to attract nurses to work in prisons, and we know that it slows down the whole of the rest of the regime. So we really need to only do that where it's absolutely uh, essential. And we need to really encourage prisoners to be responsible for their own medication. But 
uh, some of these are, are prisoners who've been on prescription medication for a long, long time um, and, and need support to do that. We've also, for example, in partnership with the Trust, looked at the type of drugs that are being prescribed. So we've, um, they are now prescribing drugs which are less attractive to people who would wish to divert them. And we've seen, interestingly, some prisoners who've been on medication for a long time suddenly stop asking for that medication. Really, the, the, the inference we draw being that nobody wants to buy it from them yeah. anymore. So there is a lot of work going on. It is the responsibility of the South Eastern Trust that we work with them to, to support their, their strategies. And you mentioned the disciplinary action against those who are fine with drugs in their system. What about for prisoners who make false accusations against prison officers or unfounded accusations against prison officers? If a prisoner does that, is there disciplinary action taken against the prison? Well, certainly when I first started working in prisons nearly 30 years ago, there used to be an internal disciplinary charge called making a false and malicious allegation. And that no longer exists because our use of the disciplinary code, I think, has become more mature and more, um, more sophisticated. <coughs> there just as the same way as any citizen has protection against people making unfounded allegations, um, our staff would have recourse um, through the criminal law, but there is no internal disciplinary charge that relates specifically to that. That's not to say if a member of staff had a particular situation where a, a, a prisoner was making an allegation against him, but there was nothing he or she could do. That's, that's not true, no. but, but the circumstances would depend very much on the individual case. Yep. Thanks very much, Chair, and um, thank you. A um, couple of things, just if I could ask. Um, the first one relates to the, the X-ray system um, that's been mentioned here in some of your briefing documentation, the, um, the transmission X-ray full body scanners. Um, if you could give me a progress update on that, please, just where, where that's at at the moment. Yes, I can. Yeah. And we just, we've just we actually had something back in the last week or so, I think, haven't we, Paul? Yeah, uh, the, this is a slow, laborious process. Yes. Um, the initial justification application was sent in May 2013. Um, that, we're actually the first devolved body to go through the justification process that, that is governed by the um, Department of Energy and Climate Change in Westminster. So we have to follow their rules and the procedures that they put in place. We didn't get a determination on that initial application until the 9th of December last year. Um, and all that determination actually said was that you can now proceed with a full application. It recognised that it was a new procedure because where X-ray um, technology has been used in the past is for the occasional traveller. It's not meant to be routinely deployed going through on a day-to-day -day basis and there are question marks about the benefits to, um, that the organisation would gain from that technology versus the particular <coughs> in terms of the, the climate and the individual and, and radiation. So we've now got permission to go through the full justification process um, and that further research is ongoing as part of that around the potential risks from, from any radiation exposure. But I, I have to throw this up and say this is not going to be a panacea for, for all of the, the application that went through recognised that even if we were given permission to use that technology today and it were to be adopted today, it doesn't yet do what we want it to do. So the application, and that's following trials, so the application is predicated on the potential for improvements to technology. And the industry believes that there will be improvements in technology, but it isn't there yet. So in the meantime, we're fulfilling our obligations by looking at other methods of detection. Um, there is a collaboration ongoing at the moment with a provider in Belfast, which may yet lead to a second pilot being run in the North Island prison within the next three to four months. And that's our hope, but we won't know until... Um, and this is re really is the holy grail for all prison services. If the technology existed, it would have been adopted. Nobody likes putting anybody through a full body search. Um, and whether your driver is decency or whether your driver is the, the costs involved in having to administer so many so everybody is looking for the solution. Right, um, we've got a detail around the pilot. What, what is the pilot that you're thinking of launching with the, the firm in Belfast? There is, there is a... Um, a particular piece of equipment that's currently in use at Port Leash, 
right. um, the multi-mode yes. threat detector, which we've been to see and which we've received reports from the IPS on, mm -hmm. that tells us that this, this isn't what we're looking for. Um, now, that's not to decry the product, but, it, but they, they haven't given us the assurance that it would do what they would want it to do, and, and it, we don't think it would do the same for us. There are certain things that simply wouldn't be detected, and too many false positives registering at Port Leash. But there is a provider <coughs> in Belfast who said, we've recognised that, we've seen the technology, we're looking at enhancing it, would you like to trial it? Okay. Um, then, just to come on to the other issues around the, the TSLs and the SIP stuff and post. Just from looking, looking at the figures here, um, for some reason or other, McGabbery and Hydebank seem to jump out of the page at you as been under-provided for, if that's the, the correct phrase. I, I can cover two parts in there. Um, I'll, I'll speak specifically about Hydebank. What, what those figures mask is the fact that accommodation is closed at Hydebank. Right, okay. But in terms of occupancy, the, the Young Offenders Estate is low in its population levels, therefore we've got accommodation closed and have had it closed for a long time. And the staff, the target staff that you will have would be our designs on if the prison was full and we needed to staff it. So it's technically wrong for what's there at the moment. For Hyde Bank, yes. At McGabry, it, it's a structural deficit, um, the, the fact Where's is... the biggest challenge is? Yeah. Right, McGabry. Okay. Then, just working down... Each chair, with with your uh, indulgence, um, the impacts of budgets on protecting people, environment, create and safer communities, uh, the reduction of offending, and you specifically it's said in the departmental uh, brief that here, the budget reduction will impact the following ways: the ability to invest in new strategies to reduce offending, grants available to voluntary and community organisations will be reduced. Program for alleged, alleged perpetrators in an advocacy service may not be progressed. Um, now, the third one, drug arrest referrals may be reduced. I'm just, I do, just don't know what that is, so I'd appreciate some outlaying that. But my question being, <clears throat> and I've raised this with the Minister, you've probably seen the <coughs> answer from it. Um, you're talking about the implications on the opposite page of having to, the cuts to result in prisoners being confined to their cells for longer periods no longer be able to respond as effectively to unforeseen events on that. So the logic of that is to try and keep as many people out of prison through earlier interventions as is possible, particularly re-offenders. But if the budget and the budget isn't that huge for some of these organisations, it's whittled away there. It could be penny wise and pound foolish because if people are coming in if then back into the system again it's a considerable cost to yourselves and even may ultimately, if there are, if there's that much of a squeeze on, and people have been crammed in prison, there may well be human rights implications for that further down the lane. I don't know. I'm not a legal person. We we have made significant reductions to our operating costs year on year, and we will have a significant challenge to, to live within our budget for next year. And we've already had conversations with those voluntary mm -hmm. community sector organisations. I think what we will do is come to an agreement with them that we design together something which delivers outcomes for offenders. Brian McCarthy, who's our Director of um, Rehabilitation, is leading on this for us, but I do know he's had those discussions already, and I've been, been part of, of that. Um, for example, we have been paying some organisations to deliver programmes for us which relate to employability for prisoners. But, but in, in many of those, they're not tied into outcomes for offenders. So they don't tie anybody down to actually getting people jobs or keeping them in jobs or giving them skills to get jobs. It's been much more nebulous than that, if you like, historically. So what we are doing is not writing those voluntary and community sector partners out of our plans. We are just going to have to be much more businesslike in the way that we commission services from them, and they understand that, and that's the world that we're all going to be operating in. So it's about being more businesslike and eliminating duplication because we've found examples where more than one organisation is paying the same... Um, <coughs> partner organisation to deliver something. We, we're not going to be able to afford that. We're going to really have to sharpen up. And we have, as a senior team, we have um, honed our skills in commissioning and in co-design of services so that we are much more intelligent <coughs> customers when we go out to those organisations. So we will be doing 
things very differently, but we value hugely the role of the volunteering community sector. And as you say, we understand that part of our role, um, as well as managing everybody that's sent to us by the courts, is, as, as the Reducing Offending Directorate, is working to um, provide alternatives. So, for example, we've been working with organisations that provide bail accommodation, um, that, that would provide step-down accommodation to try to keep people out of prison when they don't need to be in prison. Yes, uh, and then uh, the issues around drug arrest referrals, what's that, please? It's, it's, it's not, that, that's not, not prison. Not, so it doesn't, no. it's aside from you, it's just, yes. um, it, it was thrown in here and I was wondering what... What's this about? So no, that's not that's core DOJ. Okay, right, that's great. And then, in terms of the the service delivery uh, cuts, the implication of those cuts. There will be. We're we're currently um, doing a reprofiling exercise across the three prisons, which is led by Paul. And we've said before, reprofiling is something we will do on an annual basis from now on, and that's about making sure that we have the resources in the right place at the right time, doing the right things. But we know that when we have unpredictable curtailment to the regime, it makes life much more difficult for our staff and, and for prisoners who, for example, may be wanting to contact their families or maybe wanting to um, participate in certain activities. So we have uh, <coughs> determined that it would be much better, more decent, more efficient to put in place some um, predicted and well-managed um, reductions to the regime. And that will be led by Paul, but will be essentially a, a shorter core day for some prisoners. Can I yes, just elaborate on that? It, it, it's, it's a shorter core day insofar as the morning is shortened. The evening isn't. The opportunity to speak to your family still exists. But, the, but we are shortening the length of the morning um, at McGilligan Hyde Bank. But, but the key, one of the key drivers for this is we recognise um, that providing activity for all prisoners is a challenge to us as an organisation. Gilligan have just had what would otherwise have been an exceptional inspection report, which was um, the mm. first time that any Northern Ireland prison reached a top mark for resettlement. But the one area where we failed, McGilligan, was that we increased the size of that prison by 140 prisoners to cope with the, the, the rise in and we didn't put the activity places in place. And by shortening the length of the morning, it allows us to get more out of the learning and skills contracts and the contracts that we have for activities so that more people can participate in the mornings. Sorry, just chairing this will be final, just to get clarity. What do you mean by shortening the length of the morning by <coughs> an hour or two hours? No, that instead of unlocking people at eight o'clock in the morning to breakfast, we'll, we'll, we will make sure that breakfast is delivered to prisoners um, in, in advance of the morning, we will unlock them at nine to go to work. All right. Okay. Thank you. Thanks, Chair. Thanks. Bob? Chair, uh, thanks. Uh, thank you for the presentation. I noticed in the, in the presentation that uh, McGilligan to be rebuilt 2023-24, that's nine years away. What's going to happen in the interim? Um, the, there, there is a, an enabling works um, plan available and in place, ready to go if we get the funding to move forward with McGilligan. We've just got the business case approval, so the next thing is to secure the funding that we need. That oh, enabling that for the new build, sorry. Yes, for, okay. yes we've got full plan, a full building business case approval now, so uh, we can move forward. But the issue is uh, the absence of capital. Current debate, but we do have an enabling works plan that will allow us to get through the next nine years. And yes. Given the deterioration in the infrastructure, it will be challenging if we move. And that enabling works proposals, is that costly? Well, you're, you're talking, uh, I don't have an exact figure, but yes, you'd be talking about one to two million pounds to maintain services and to clear parts of the site, the operational site, to allow the new development to, to commence. Yeah. All right, thanks. Um, Second quick question, Chair, and that is around uh, drug use in, in the prisons. And I asked this the last day you were up as well, and you were, I suppose, highlighting the, the success and how the, it appeared to be uh, improving, or the situation appeared to be improving. Do you still feel that's the case? I, I do, and we are improving in a number of areas. We've said before our intelligence-led approach to searching find more drugs. 
the uh, work we've done in partnership with the Southeastern Trust means that there are fewer attractive drugs for diversion and that all arrangements to supervise uh, prisoners taking medication are, are better. We know that um, certainly uh, across the piece the number of prisoners testing positive on random mandatory drug testing is, is reducing. But it will always be a really challenging area and there will always be more to do. Paul, do you want to... Yeah. Say any more about that. I, I think it's the, the one area where we have to. We had tremendous successes this year in terms of reducing the thoughts within prisons, and the one area where I'd like to see more investment next year in terms of management, <coughs> in terms of drug supply reduction. That the fact is, um, we changed tact at McGillan <coughs> and achieved many achieved very good results. Um, the benefits at Hyde Bank and McGabry have been marginal. Um, there has been improvement, but it's not significant in terms of its improvement. But we showed in a, in a brief pilot with the police that what can be done when organisations work together. There was improvement at that time. And we know that the investment we're putting into the search facilities at McGabry will strengthen our grip. Um, and also believe that by, pro by producing a refreshed drug strategy for the service um, and, and working with health, we're asking them to... to that, in the real world there is no new money but we're asking them to move money around to via money so that we get a better return on, on what's paid out for drug treatments. We think all of that will have an impact. How would you describe the drug situation in the prisons in Northern Ireland? Would you describe it as a serious situation or a moderate situation? We'd probably describe it as, as reflecting the, the challenges that exist in society. So I would suggest that, as I said before, we are a concentration, but I, I know um, that schools and um, other organisations have, have a challenge because drugs is, is a, an increasing problem for us as a society. I do think there are some prisoners who come to our doors with very serious long-term addictions and they um, will exhibit drug-seeking behaviour throughout their stay with us and, and people will uh, be very ingenious at, at trying to work out ways to, to find those drugs but we also see a good many people who want to use their time in custody to come off drugs to address addiction and where we ran a pilot at McGabry um, a, a drug recovery pilot in conjunction with the South Eastern Trust and Start 360 um, we, we, saw, um, we, we saw evidence of that high level of motivation so <coughs> I think it's, it's sometimes easy to use highly emotive language about about prisons and drugs, but it is challenging is the word I would use if I had to choose. And please let us not forget that much of the abuse, substance abuse that takes place in prisons is over prescribed medication and 80% of the population of McGabry are on prescribed medication. That, that, that's a fact that you know, over a quarter of the population at McGabry will have received an urgent referral to mental health services um, and if you're looking it doesn't matter what measure of vulnerability and um, challenge you look at, whether it's personality disorders or with psychotic disorders or depression, you will find the population of McGabry is acute and will require much medical support and, and will, will manifest their behaviour in terms of drug seeking behaviour and trading. Yes. Yeah, thank you, Chair. Tommy? Uh, thank you, Chair. Um, <clears throat> The Criminal Justice Inspection Report on the 25th, 26th of February, and it says that uh, performance has slipped since it was last inspected as regards McGilligan in 2010, and action is needed to prevent further decline. I see you've mentioned some of that action that you can take, but it also mentions here about insufficient purposeful activity for prisoners. Um, um, I, I've worked in, in prisons and over years with prisoners uh, and their families and ex-prisoners, and for me, that's one of the most negative things for any pris prisoner. You know, insufficient purpose activity. And I just enough, I was speaking to someone yesterday um, up here who worked with prisoners. And he was saying, certainly in McGarvey at the moment, that is um, a, a problem. And, and what he was saying was that the courses that you do run are very often oversubscribed. The prisoners actually enjoy them and it, it helps them a lot. Yep. So could you maybe just respond on how you're actually dealing with, with that major yep, issue? Certainly. First of all, we think that the negative headlines in that inspection report didn't reflect the feedback that we had. So 
if he had only um, <coughs> slipped back in one of the four um, tests of a healthy prison on the purpose of activity. No, that said, it is a crucial area. The report was of an inspection that had happened some months ago, and since then we've made real progress. And Paul will know the numbers, but we have gone from small numbers of prisoners working out from McGilligan to typically now around, um, do you know the figure, Paul, about 40? Uh, well, tw you, you have around 28 employers or, yep. or providers of training services who regularly take Yeah, so, and that would be more than one prisoner in each one. So we, but the, as, as Paul said, we'd increase the population and not uh, built more in, in terms of infrastructure to support activities. When I've spoken to various stakeholder groups, I've issued something of a challenge, though, and I've said that we are working very, very hard, and I personally do a lot in terms of engaging with people outside, um, outside groups and voluntary and community sector groups and employers, and we have a good number of people who would be willing to provide purposeful activity both inside our prisons and by giving people jobs. But the, the, the difficulty is we need people to champion that. We need people to respond when the media get hold of it and, um, and, and make it a, a point of success to get these people sacked or, or to um, discourage groups from, from being willing to work in partnership with us. We really do need people to, to work with us on that because a good deal of my time is spent on this issue around employment and um, education. Um, it's absolutely crucial. We need to do more, um, but we can't do it all on our own. Can I... Uh... Yeah. I mean, one of the, plan, the elements of the plans for the new prison is to ensure that we do have yeah. sufficient constructive activity places. So there's a balance depending on the amount of investment you put in now and, and the uh, tension between uh, funding that and waiting for the funding to do the new prison. But the new prison will have the activity places. That's what we're planning for. Mm. And, and certainly why I, uh, um, I mentioned some of those negative things, I want mm. to rec recognise that the report says that Real progress has been, been made. So. Thank you, Chair. Yeah. Sorry, I had to go out. You mentioned uh, so about the stock take, and there was an opportunity to normalise the prison. Was it an opportunity missed? <coughs> and where do we go from here? We don't believe it has yet been missed, and we still see that that is our opportunity. So we're still committed to the um, to the outworkings of the stock take, particularly the independently chaired forum. Um, we um, continue to work with the independent assessors um, and with, um, with, with the minister and others to, to work our way through that. Um, but it is tricky stuff, we've always said that, and it's, it is taking um, longer than we had hoped to, um, to, to progress those recommendations but it is still the way forward. And is engagement and communication with prisoners in Row House continuing, or has that been broken off? Um, it has been um, sporadic in that um, it, it, there have been times when, when communication has not been happening, but there have been other times when, when it has, and we, we continue to, to use the um, Minister's um, independent assessors as, as interlocutors where that's appropriate. Um, obviously, there is, um, there is engagement on a daily basis with the staff who work on those landings and with the, the managers, but also at a more strategic level. <coughs> the, 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 the key to improving the quality and the quantity of those communities is to get the forum up and working. Okay, right. okay, uh, on the drugs one, what percentage of prisoners who met me just use prescribed drugs? What percentage of prisoners? Prescribed drugs. 80% of the <coughs> recovery. Okay. And the drugs uh, testing that Randox were complaining about not, not being able to tender for, the one that you actually tender for, does it cover prescribed drugs or is it no prescribed drugs? The, the, I mean, just in terms of putting the direct prescribed Randox, it's, my understanding is that it's, um, the actual drugs that we test for, we routinely test for eight substances, but we have, permi we have permission within our existing contract and within any future contract to test for any other substance. We simply <coughs> have to say what it is we want to be tested. It seems to me that you're going for a second-rate drug testing mechanism. 
on the basis that it has reduced charge? I, I, I can clarify that. I, I don't believe that's the case, because if you're looking at new psychoactive substances, Pierce and I will tell you that there are 348 known to them at this number, at moment in time. Some are illicit, some are not yet illegal, but they're new psychoactive drugs. And every day, as soon as somebody makes something illegal, a clever chemist puts a grain of salt in, it changes its chemical compound, and you've got a new test. If, if you're looking at um, a testing regime, the only way you can make it foolproof is to follow the athletics bodies and take somebody's DNA body footprint today and come back to it six months later and say that's changed. And we, we simply couldn't do that. We don't have the, the money that the Olympics movement has. It strikes me a little unusual that a company that's operating in 151 countries in the world um, struggles to, to to, to get a, a very legitimate testing regime in here on the basis that it's more convenient for administration purposes um, to do it with the Scottish? I think the, I mean, I think the, the sometimes, we, I mean, the, the, the whole concept of, of competitive tendering um, has to be absolutely transparent. So it, it's all done in a way that, you know, you or I, if we wanted to, could go and satisfy ourselves that it's been properly administered. I wouldn't necessarily say that we are satisfied with it, to be honest, but... Uh, Moving on from that particular one, on uh, the, the new officers that you've brought in, the, the civilian officers, are they uh, second class officers? Sorry, the civilian officers? Yeah. We, don't, we don't have anything called civilian officers. The, the civilians within, within the, the prison service? They regard as dispensable, are they? I'm, I genuinely you have civilian staff within the prison service? This is non uniformed staff. Civilian staff, yes. Yeah. Not prison officers, but there's not prison officers. Yeah. Okay. And I then regard this as dispensable. Mm -hmm. uh, that's good because it appeared in the last week uh, that security notifications to those individuals have stopped. Um, we are in discussion, I mean, Mark and, and, and Paul are in discussion with Brian Milford from NIPSA, and we have been absolutely clear. We ha are given information by the um, PS and I. We don't own that information. The, the, the information sharing protocols are very clear that that is PS and I information that they share with us. Where they give us any information, any information at all that um, any um, member of staff, any member of our staff is at risk or under threat, we share that information immediately. If that information is specifically about prison officers, we can only share it with prison officers. So, 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 we, we, so we, but we are. They will still get security notification, but if it is specific to prison officers, prison officers only get that. Yes, but but we will we will make sure that Brian Milford, uh, on, on behalf of NIPSA, uh, understands that, and it is absolutely not any sort of judgment about the um, respective value of any of our staff. It is just the rules that we have to follow. Otherwise, we would not receive that information at all from the police. They have made that absolutely clear to us, that if we don't follow their protocols, they will, they will cut off the flow of information. Okay. Fair enough. Um, Rule House, um, you, you mentioned it in your open comments, and obviously there was some issues uh, which uh, led to you, you having to step up with security on it. Uh, had you a gold command? <coughs> Yes. That gold command stood down. Um, at the, for, once the incident had ended, I, the the because I, I know that because Paul was gold command and I also stayed um, until gold had closed. So contrary to suggestions which I have also heard that it was stood down before the incident had ended, it, it was it was fully open until we were satisfied that the incident had been brought to a conclusion. It's, it's, it's just clear. two separate incidents at McGabry on the same day. One prison management. That one was finished before 7 o'clock and gold closed at either 8 or 9 minutes past 7. Separate incident, police management, managed by the police, not, not by gold command. So, so gold um, at Dundonald House yeah. shut at the same time as silver shut their operation down at McGabry Prison. So gold command closed at 7 o'clock, which so is really a relatively short period of time before a, a fairly substantial protest took place. In the grounds of the prison? But it, well, outside the prison. Police provenance. Outside the prison. Prison property or it public was, it, property? It was outside the extern gate, but we were. It, was it, it prison was, property or public property? 
but it was not within it was not it's not within our gift to police incidents such as the one that that took place. We but simply have no authority to do. It wasn't prison properly. We, we have a memorandum of understanding with the police that says where our responsibilities start and where they stop, and they stop at the external gate. See, a lot of us were horrified whenever we watched one of your officers drive into a circumstance which could have turned out to be much worse. And, and, and Paul and I have met with, with, with one of the assistant chief constables um, already to discuss um, why, why that happened. I'm, I'm sure you wouldn't want me to share that with you in a public forum, but we have met and um, have addressed the issues that perhaps contributed or led to that happening and have made arrangements to make sure that we, we address any, um, any repetition. I've also met the, the deputy and chief constable over this issue and I don't think the public will find it acceptable that the prison service are batting it over to the PSNI and the PSNI are batting it over to the prison service. <coughs> uh, one of your officers was put at uh, a risk of being put in that position. Um, you had a gold command operating which was stood down you know, a couple of hours prior to that and uh, that uh, in itself uh, caused us concern. Uh, Ms McAllister, was there any uh, threats issued uh, in, in the prison over the row house incident? Any threats made against prison officers? Can I just, can I just consult with my colleagues? Would not be difficult. We would, we, we would um, very happy to, to have a conversation with you about this, but we're just a little uncomfortable sharing some of the sensitive nature of this conversation in this setting. About threats? It, uh, about our staff. Mm -hmm. if, if, you wish us to, if you wish us to continue, we will, but equally we might well, prefer to have that I, I conversation. Suppose, suppose if, if, it's, if it's helpful, you move in the closed session for a period of time to discuss this issue and then open up again. It, that that yeah. would be helpful. Members yes. are agreeing yes. to that? Yeah. 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 To hear the gallery then. Lord Nand Assembly, Committee Room 21. This. Let's give it another chance. Answer it back in. Thanks, sir. <coughs> Thanks for the presentation. Just in regard to um, the need for a new women's facility, what is the latest update? Where, where are we at with that? Max, do you want to talk about the women's facility? Yeah, we have uh, the outline business case developed. Uh, it's with our colleagues in finance and financial service directorate within the DOJ. We hope it will go to FSD shortly uh, for final determination. Have the plans and indicative plans, and the okay. it's probably worth saying we've we've also started work on the step down facility for women, which is a six bedroom house being built outside of the perimeter of Hyde Bank. That's that's under construction and will be completed by the summer, and that will provide essentially six open places for women coming towards the end of their sentence or women who don't need conditions of, of security. So people in, in old speaker would have been assessed as category D prisoners. So that's six places. Um, and the women's prison that we are planning will have 36 cells and then uh, a number of those six bedroomed um, self supporting low supervision units within, within the perimeter and that number can be flexible to take account of fluctuations in the population. But we are, we believe, making a, uh, a, a decision only to have 36 cellular um, places based on our assessment of the security needs of the, of the women's population. A good number of them don't need to be in cellular accommodation. Is there resources set aside to begin this, if planning is...? The, the issue is about capital funding. We've been... Um, uh, this year's capital funding has been reduced by around 50%. So we're limited in what we can progress this year. We will, as Susan said, with the directory remarks, uh, we will commence the work on the new 360 block at McGilligan. The uh, invitation to tender will go out shortly. 
but we are not able to progress work on McGilligan or the new women's prison if the approval was through because we have no assurance of funding beyond the 15-16 financial period. So what we're doing now is discussing through the Department of Justice with the Department of Finance and Personnel uh, uh, how we can make progress with the uh, implementation of the state strategy. We we'll have the business case approved with £200 million worth of business case approvals in place at the moment, and now we need to find how we get that funding stream to allow the annual funding requirements of around envelopes of £30 million, uh, to progress, because we think there is a major benefit at the end of the programme. Um, but obviously, um, we're in the hands uh, of others who control the purse strings. No, indeed, I think there's a real need to push ahead with this. I think this facility has been for a number of years, and it's been promised nearly for a number of years now too. So, <coughs> the sooner the better, sort of thing. So, thank you. Sure. Okay, Mr. Chair. Um, turning to um, some progressive issues, now, I listened with interest to some of the programme on, on, on Radio Ulster today, um, and it struck me that. Um, with all of the difficulties that you have with prison estate, and I appreciate the costs involved in, in improvements and, and building programmes, and just maybe one side comment, a regular criticism that comes across our desks in this place and in debates that happened about things that have happened in the past are why have you spent so much money on doing repairs and temporary replacements when, in, and indeed sometimes millions of pounds on doing that, and actually over that length of period of time, it would have been much more sensible to actually have knocked down and rebuilt. I'll ask you to comment on that aspect of it. But going on from the radio programme, what innovative ways does the prison service have? And what contribution do you make to the debate around um, everything from appropriate and secure uh, tagging of people in the community, to step-down facilities and to more open facilities, either as people progress towards the end of their sentence or, indeed, quite often from very shortly into their sentence when they don't actually pose a serious uh, threat to the community, but their liberty has to be deprived as the court has determined. And for example, I heard somebody saying today in that radio programme that you can actually have weekend prisoners. Um, I just would have been interested to hear what your comment and views on that and what contribution NIPS is making to that discussion. Well, we now, as you may know, are part of a, a reducing offending directorate which includes youth justice and, um, and has um, responsibility for policy relating to, to community um, provision. So we have a, a dotted line, if you like, with, with colleagues in the PBNI. So we are part of that debate. We've got um, Burren House on the Crumlin Road, which is what was the, the assessment unit, um, which is now operating very successfully with very strict controls, but doing a, a, a very good job in testing people um, before they return to the community. And the step-down house that I've just talked about will be, if, if you like, an equivalent facility for women. We also work in uh, partnership with community and voluntary sector who provide hostel accommodation. So the um, that there are hostels across Northern Ireland run by organisations, often church-based organisations, faith-based organisations, that, that take some prisoners who are technically still serving a sentence. We've also been looking at, at, the, at the other end around bail and whether we could do more to support um, bail provision. So I went last week to, with, with a colleague from Extern um, to look at um, what was being done in another jurisdiction to provide bail accommodation. Because we think if we could give more options to sentences, they may be more willing to look at alternatives to remand in custody. Um, we, we've, we also work very closely with the parole commissioner to, to look at how people can be released safely on licence and also the issue of recalls from licence to understand the reasons why recalls is higher than we would want it to be. Just on the subject of weekend prison, to my knowledge, it hasn't been tried here. I do know that when it was tried in England and Wales, there was barely any take-up from judges and, and, and magistrates. People, whether it was because it's not in, in, in our psyche, it's, it's well used in Scandinavian countries, successfully used over there, um, so that you do, you, you have some people who go to prison Monday to Friday, and you have others who go to prison at the weekend, and that, that sort of... Um, hot bedding in prisons, if you like, to make best use of the capacity. But it um, hasn't proved popular where, it's, where the pro co concept has been tested. So I don't know what appetite there would be for that here. But obviously, if there were 
uh, an appetite at a, at a political level, we would be obliged to, to consider it. But we think actually more pragmatic solutions are available to us and um, in regular use and successfully testing people for their return to the community. In respect of the um, spending on repairs, Max is probably best place to answer. There that. is a presumption nowadays that we not be temporary buildings in. It's only an absolute our urgent need that we would do that. So the last one that we put in for residential accommodation was Alpha and McGilligan, and that was at a time where the population uh, was increasing at around 10, 11 per cent per annum, and it was a choice for a quick fix. So the presumption is now permanent builds across our three sites, uh, and that's why the implementation of the estate strategy becomes so critical, because a lot of our temporary buildings are at McGilligan, for example, the Nissan Huts, uh, and the temporary accommodation for Alpha Foil and, and, and Spurn are all approaching the end of their lifespan. If we don't move now to build a, a new accommodation block at Gilligan, we're going to be put in a position where we're going to have to look to perhaps temporary accommodation because that's the only option. And that would be extremely regrettable and unhelpful given where we are at this point in time. Uh, thank you very much, Chair. Um, uh, time's moving on, and a lot of my questions have already been answered. I wish you well in terms of the prison reform, but just in terms of the reduction of budget, uh, Max already referred to the 50% cut in, in capital expenditure, but day-to-day -day expenditure, um, that has been affected as well uh, to some extent. Can you manage the prison reform programme, or can you reshape it? so as to cut the reductions in uh, budget? It will be a challenge, but we are not facing any challenge that other people in the public sector uh, are not facing. So our criminal justice partners are seeing similar budget reductions and, and across the public service people are seeing um, bigger cuts to their budgets than have ever been seen before. What we have had to do is to look, in, in response to your question specifically about the reform programme, we've had to look at the, some of the 40 recommendations and determine whether we can meet those recommendations in, in, in the spirit in which they were intended, even if not um, deliver what was actually envisaged at the time. So, for example, working with our colleagues in PBNI, the, um, rolling out the Inspire model for young men um, has proved something of a challenge, but they have now found a solution so that it might not look <coughs> as it had looked, as it had been, it'd been conceived by the prison review team, but, but we will meet um, some of those recommendations. But um, we have been absolutely clear that our budget reductions must drive creativity and um, make us think the unthinkable rather than um, allow us to petrify and... Um, and give up. So we will deliver it. Some of it might look different. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, uh, the McGilligan report uh, was in the main not bad, uh, but there were some criticism already been addressed, I think, by one of my colleagues. But there was one issue at page 34, paragraph 230, and said, in our survey, 41% of Catholic prisoners compared to 27% of Protestant prisoners said they'd been victimised by a member of staff. And then goes on to say, data consistently showed that Catholics were disproportionately represented in relation to discipline and the uh, IEP scheme. Um, uh, these discrepancies were not being investigated uh, robustly. Uh, by managers and prisoners were not being formally consulted with to ascertain their experiences and concern. What, what, what's your comment on that and what action has been taken? Because I know in the past there were complaints about uh, the disproportionate number of Catholics who, who were under discipline within the, the, the prison service uh, uh, generally, uh, and I thought that that had been addressed. It's about a couple of years ago now. Well, it, it is for your time. Yeah, it, it is something we give a significant amount of management attention to. The whole issue of poorer outcomes for some um, some parts of the, the the prisoner community, and every prison, as you know, has a, an equality and diversity committee, which is attended by external um, membership as well, including representatives from the criminal justice inspectorate. Um, we do know that it continues to be um, an issue, but. Um, I'll let Paul say something in a minute because I know that on his, re on his monthly visits, fortnightly in the case of McGabry, he, he drills down um, and looks at 
not only confirms that we are good, because we are very good now at identifying where, what, what that, those data are telling us. So all the stuff you just said, Alban, about poorer outcomes for some sections, we're very good at identifying where those hotspots are and where we need to focus. But we need to get better at um, determining why that is, understanding why that is, so that we can do something about it. Paul, do you want to say something yeah, I mean, else about that? If you, if you were to sample it for the first time now, you'd find that the, the processes are sound um, in terms of how data is analysed, who's present when that's analysed and what sort of external oversight exists towards it. You know, we do have somebody from cg &E embedded on those meet, at those meetings to satisfy themselves, but the outcomes still aren't right <coughs> in areas. Um, and I think, I think that's going to take time to filter through. Um, what I am satisfied is that the governors are applying the probity they need to. So, so for instance, as an, a potted example, if um, there are a disproportionately high number of Catholic prisoners being placed on report, then they will inquire into, is this happening in a particular area of the prison? Mm -hmm. Is it a particular officer within that area? Um, or is it, um, is it for a particular offence? And is there something about the regime, the way the regime operates, that encourages that? So they're asking those questions, um, and, and we, my sense is that applying the right level of inquiry and, um, and my experience is what gets measured gets done so, so you will see improvement gradually but it isn't overnight it will take time and I haven't yet seen the outcomes that I want to see. Yeah. No, we, we ran some additional training on this just about three weeks ago um, because it's the hot spot to actually make sure the people that are chairing those meetings part of those meetings are properly identifying all of the issues and drilling back and coming back to the following meetings with actions and outcomes rather than um, just lip service and things like that. So we're, we're, we're upping the game. Thank you very much, Chair. Thank you very much, Chair, and I appreciate it. I know I ask questions in the, the closed session as well, but it, it's just a number <coughs> of observations. The, I refer back to the, the ANR's report and I mean again, uh, I'll say I would bank the day and it was an impressive, uh, if you like, you know, of the college and its work and how it's panned out. The trajectory towards the college w would have it happened without the Anna Ehrs report, in your opinion? Would it have happened? Yeah. Um, I think the 40 recommendations <coughs> in the OAS mm. review report have given us permission to do some things that might have been more difficult to land given the financial landscape. So there may have been um, pushback against the concept of a college, which will be more expensive in some ways in that the, the contract with Belfast Met College um, will um, in, in some areas um, give us some financial challenges. So um, I, I, I hope so. I think the leadership at Hyde Bank is committed to making it happen. I think there is a great um, deal of, of support, certainly from the Justice Minister and, 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 um, and others, um, for it to happen. I think it makes sense for it to happen, and I think the early signs are really encouraging. Because, uh, I mean, uh, there doesn't seem to be much evidence of, of, a, of a moving towards that until maybe it was given a bit of impetus, and I'll say yeah. it, I mean, as broadly as that. And the reason why I say that, because I think the, the errors report allowed, if you like, a snapshot of where prisons were at and where they should be progressing. Right? And it was, uh, that was the theory and then the practice had to come. But one of the other uh, recommendations, and, and when you're in McCarby and you speak to the senior management, you know, the, the, the number of prisoners, the complexity, the, the rollover remands, you know, find offenders, uh, uh, top security, and then you have the separate regimes and, uh, and rule. But one of the recommendations was that they, they have four many prisons. Uh, I mean, from our observation going up, and Dean McGarvey, there's always a coolness towards that from the management, and it hasn't been progressed. Now, the Irish report took us to the high bank changes which most people see as progressive. I'm just wondering how much are we held back in putting proper regimes in place in McGarvey, which might help you resolve the issues in, in Roe as well. Absolutely. And, and I think, and, and, and colleagues may want to come in, but the, we talked about the 360 block at McGarvey. The 360 block really is the first piece 
um, the first uh, tangible, visible piece in that um, piece of work, which is about reconfiguring Lagabri into three um, discrete areas, although with, with shared services to give it, it some efficiency. But um, the 360 will enable us to, to start to plan um, a configuration and, and regimes which will um, allow for three very separate um, populations. So a high security facility, um, a facility for remand prisoners, and then uh, a facility which won't need to, to be um, have those high security, security levels of, of provision. So there has been uh, there has been some nervousness at local level about it. We understand that completely, and Paul has done a great deal of work with uh, the local leadership to, to just reassure them about that and explain what that means. But that remains what we're committed to deliver because that will take a significant amount of cost out of Mugabri and improve outcomes at the same time. Okay, thank you. And, and, and just, I mean, in relation to the McElligan report, uh, I'm just, two observations. One, what now will be done to bring it back to where the last report was? And, and, and how, did the, how do you think the slippage happened? And I, I'm actually struck, you know, and this is not a case for no poor physical conditions, but one of the observations made by the inspectorate was uh, good standards of cleanliness, a decent, low, rather bleak external environment, good time out of cell combined with good relationship between staff and prisoners. And I think that's important, you know, that, you know, Whereas we'd want to see new prisons and better facilities, <clears throat> but if the regime is one where people are locked up, there is no purposeful activity, then the shiny building doesn't compensate for it. No, absolutely. And you, you mentioned, first of all, we've said this before, but in relation to the four tests, we'd only slipped back on one, and we understand why that was, because of the rising population and, and not enough yeah. purposeful activity space. So, so we just need to be clear about that. And also... One of the things we probably need to explain to some of the external stakeholders that are commenting um, on this is that when we talk about absence of constructive activity in McGilligan, the alternative isn't that prisoners are locked in their cells because they're not. Um, the default position at McGilligan is that prisoners' are, uh, uh, cells are open. And I've actually, I've actually worked in McGilligan. I've, I've, I've gone and worked alongside officers um, uh, for a, a shift on, on, a, on a block and seen that that... that is, is real. So prisoners are unlocked in the morning and, um, and they, they remain open during the core day. That's not to say we don't need to put constructive activity in place because we do, but it, it, we're, we're not locking people up as an alternative constructive activity. Oh, no, 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 no. So people do um, have, have some things to do, they're just not what we would, would call purposeful activity. So vote, there isn't enough vocational training, there isn't enough education, there isn't enough um, intervention work provided. Yeah. And uh, how, how do we bridge that gap? How do we bridge that gap? Yeah. We, so, do you want to yeah, I was just going to add, 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 we're in the final stages of an agreement with Dell to bring North West College um, into um, McGilligan and um, Belfast Met into High Bank and McGabry that will significantly increase right the way across the board our ability to deliver um, education and vocational education as well. I mean, there's quite an exciting list and it's cheaper. Um, because the way Dell can lever through funding and things like that that we can't lever, we're able to get a much higher provision which should bridge the gap where we've been unable to put some of that real purposeful activity in place and it has just been just activity um, to be able to give qualifications, um, to be able to give... Um, they should be in expanding our curriculum across all three jails. And, and, and what, 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 what increased the expansion? Many more, because I think one of the discussions we had even with the, during the Anne Orr's report is that, you know, courses sometimes are limited to 12 people, you know, and, and you're trying to make the point that sometimes there, there's a dropout, yeah. you know, through it, you know, and you're trying to make that point that rather than this sort of thing, you can only have 12 places, you know, you have 24 people on the course, they may not all want to do, Yep. Exam, but, but at least, yes. at least and, it's an and, attempt. And that's, you're, yeah. you're right, that's about, t we need to be cleverer at timetabling and scheduling. And we've been looking at what tools um, other organisations use to account for all of that. You're absolutely <coughs> right, because uh, prisoners, as well as doing, if they're on a course, for example, also need to take their visits. They need to take healthcare appointments where, where they need to do that. So it's, you're right, it's not good enough to say that course is for 12, so we start 12, and if people drop out, that's all well and good. We can't afford... We can't afford to do that anymore. I think it's also 
fair to say, though, that in the period since the report was written, we've increased the number of working out opportunities for prisoners, because a good number of the prisoners at McGilligan are suitable to work out. And we continue to work with um, local potential employers and, and local organisations, because that was always part of the um, a, a agreement on, on which the decision to keep McGilligan was predicated. So we need to optimise access to those opportunities as well. And, I mean, the final point would just be, I mean, and we covered it mostly in the closed session, but the opportunity exists from the, the independent assessment in the progresses, and I don't think we should that up. Absolutely. Thank you. Just on the points, uh, Chair, uh, you mentioned about the scanning uh, machines earlier for uh, Patsy's question. Uh, you said there was issues there that still had to be resolved or advanced uh, technologies. Uh, with regards to the pilot scheme, there was an issue around the, detect the differences in detecting metal compared to other materials. Is that the case where there is a say, blind spot, if you like, with regards to other non-metallic material? This specifically on X-ray or in general? The, on the scanner, on the X-ray scanner. Um, if, if you're looking at the X-ray technology, it was more about the size of the articles that it could detect. Right, okay. so, so if you're looking at um, substance misuse drugs, we tend to find really small quantities and they simply wouldn't be detected on an X-ray machine. Right, okay. Uh, with regards to a procedure when, or standing operating procedure when up and prisoners get injured, uh, Obviously, ambulance may be called or, or an a accident report be filled out. Uh, is there a standard operating procedure for a staff member? Staff member is injured. Injured at work. Well, well in, insofar as there are a number of procedures if staff get um, injured at work, we have, the law requires us to have first aiders on site to deal with incidents, and we enough first aiders to actually contend with that. The law requires us to make sure that we use the accident, we use the health and safety apparatus that goes along with it, and we use that. We have protocols in, agreed with a couple of hospitals um, whereby if, if staff were at risk of contamination, how they would be fast-tracked through the process so that they received the, the right treatment at the right time without delay. If, if prophylaxis is going to be required, it's in necessity. So we have a number of procedures. Okay, okay. And then the last question, you talk about recruitment drive. Uh, would it be possible to get us the, uh, it's not the right word, perspective maybe or curriculum that uh, a recruit would go through Training, the training program, training. absolutely. Is yes, that an eight no week? Problem. I see eight weeks, isn't it? Uh, yes. uh, it's, it's eight weeks. Um, our view over the new recruitment, because we'll train them, for, we'll bring people into PECs and train them as officers. It's going to be a ten week program. One week of that is a white sheet. But yeah, we can give you the full curriculum. Uh, that would be great. And just on that point, and a very quick point, Chair, how much of that is actually practical experience inside the environment for which they will be working? The majority of um, that stuff is practical, um, takes place in, a, in kind of mock cells and all of those, those kind of elements, um, coupled with the classroom experiences. Um, what we have learned from the previous training and we'll do more of in this training is more actual time on live weeks as part of, of, of the research rather than just mock cell um, side. So we're going to increase that. But it's probably 60 to 70 percent practical and the rest classroom based and we might go a bit further than practical. That, that would be useful to have yeah. that information and maybe the differential from the previous uh, recruitment yeah. Yeah. Uh, um, So that would be great. That would be you great. Know. Thank you, Chair. Okay. Thank you, Paul. Thank you, everyone. Okay. So thanks very much. Okay. For the of quite a bit more to get through here, so um, with your indulgence, we're going to rattle through this as quickly as we, we can. Um, if we move on to agenda item six, is again a formal consideration of the justice bill. Well, many of you were last week in terms of the, the process we'll go through, so we'll go through uh, different elements of it. If people can indicate if they're generally content or if they want any further information from the department, we can do that. We'll have a mop-up session um, next week before we go through the formal Clause by clause, anyhow. Um, 
So if we move on then to part one and schedule one, which is the single jurisdiction for county courts and magistrate courts, I can refer you to tabs one to four of your hard copy folder. Just to remind members, following the oral evidence session with department officials, the committee agreed to write to the Office of the Lord Chief Justice and request further information on the nature of the consultation that will be carried out on the directions on who will be consulted. The response will be circulated as soon as it is received. At the meeting of the 10th of December, the committee also had agreed to write to the President of the Association of County Court Judges, requesting their view and comments on the provisions, and our response on that is still uh, awaited as well. So, members, I'll open it up, um, and if people can indicate whether or not they are content, clauses 1 to 6 and schedule 1 of the Justice Bill, or if there's any further information that people wish to gain. But there may be just some issues. But we don't need any more information. We certainly know the, the issues. Okay. No other comments? Okay. Move on then. Part two in schedules two and three is the committal for trial. So again, members, I refer you to tabs five to seven of the hard copy folder. The relevant papers, including further information provided by the department relating to the number of cases not proceeding to trial, which is requested during the oral evidence session with officials. So, members, again, I'll open it up to comment on whether members are content with clause 7 to 16 and schedules 2 and 3 of the Justice Bill, or whether any additional information or clarification is required. Chair, when you say content, are you meaning that we are in full agreement with clause? Well, it's, an, it's informal to see whether we generally content well. Right, the yeah, you're just, many wants to yeah, just test in the waters. Yes. Okay. I think I think if there's something which the committee, as a committee, felt very strongly opposed to, we would wish to indicate that perhaps today. Or if there's anything we wish to amend, we perhaps would indicate that today. I mean, individual parties will take their own view when it goes to the floor of the house. But as a committee, I think just if there's issues we could flag up, and it will give us a, a chance to maybe get those addressed before we go to formal close by close. So. Any comments, or are we generally content? The, the department also highlighted that the, the PPS has suggested that Clause 12 could usually be amended uh, to enable the direct transfer of a co defendant who has been charged with a non specified offence. And if the committee is minded to accept the need for the amendment, it will uh, bring that forward at consideration stage. It's just for information. So, are we content to support the proposed amendment? Or? Sure. Yeah. Just, just to make it clear, uh, I'm not saying we're opposing yes. the, the intent of, of these clauses, but we do have concerns about them. And I just want to make that clear. Okay. That's fine. And is there any additional information? No, no, or just no, no, I think it's just a matter of consideration and argument. That's fine. Okay. So in terms of the, the PPS suggestion, are we happy enough to give consideration to that amendment if it comes forward then? Yeah. 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 Okay, part six, live links and criminal proceedings, refer to tabs eight to ten of the hard copy for relevant papers including further information provided by the Department following the oral evidence session. The Committee sought clarification from the Department following its oral evidence session, Part 6, a copy of the Department's response to Tab 8 of the hard pack. So again, I'll open up if members can indicate their views, clauses 44 to 49, whether anybody requires any further information. Or Generally content. Okay. Right. If everyone's happy enough, move on to part seven, violent offences prevention orders. Refer to tabs 11 to 14 of the hard folder, uh, including further information provided for the department relating to VOPOs and information disclosed as part of the Access NI check protest, which was requested during the oral evidence session. Um, so again, ask members are they content with clauses 50 to 71? Or is there any other information that they require? Up 
happy enough and then move on. But can I also suggest that over the next few days that maybe in the parties we'll look at some of these issues, just for a mop up session, we can maybe, if there's any concerns, we can, we can address that. Okay. Move on then to part eight, miscellaneous provisions. I remember to tab 15 of the hard copy folder in the clause 72 to 76 with the covered jury service. Um, again, open it up whether members are content with clauses 72 to 76, <coughs> whether requiring information or clarification. Okay. I refer members to tab 16 of the hard copy folder for the relevant papers relating to 77 and 78 to cover early guilty pleas. And again, Members can indicate whether they're generally content with clauses 77 and 78 or if any additional permission is required. The, I mean, just to say, I mean, it yep. includes the duty on this solicitor, doesn't it? Yes. Yeah. 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 I mean, we would have concerns about that. Yeah. Tab 17 of the hard copy folder for the relevant papers within the clauses 79 and 80, which cover avoiding delay in criminal proceedings. So, again, members, any comments on clauses 79 and 80 of the bill? Are any members needing further clarification or information? Nope. <coughs> My bloody thing. Generally content. Okay. Refer members to tab 18 of the hard copy folder for relevant papers relating to clauses 81 to 85, which cover public prosecutor summons, defence access to premises, court security officers, and youth justice. And again, open it up for members for comments. Clauses 81, 82, 83, 84, and 85. I just check out. I think some of these are just technical. Is that right? Yeah, no. I mean, no real issue raised when they during the oral evidence session. Okay, happy enough. Part nine, supplementary provisions. Tab nineteen, the hard copy folder for relevant papers, including further information from the department and the purpose and effect of clause eighty six. Um, open up the members. Eighty six is that amendment that departments stick in at the end of bills, which seems yeah. to give them a huge scope for doing stuff <coughs> that they haven't gone through. So if members are, are uh, generally content, I, I would be minded to oppose that. I don't see the, the necessity of it. Um, and perhaps we can have a, a discussion on the mop-up day, but yeah. it's yeah. a bad habit that I think departments are getting into, all departments, not just this one. I also keep them on their toes. Uh, Chair, they asked to you know, justification for having it in. Mm. They don't seem to feel like it was any justification. <coughs> okay. I move on then to agenda item seven. Formal consideration of proposed amendments by the Attorney General. We had a brief discussion this last week. Yeah. <coughs> now, fair members have 20 to 26 of the hard copy folder uh, for papers relating to the Attorney General's proposed amendment to the Coroner's <coughs> Act, 59. Further correspondence has been received from the, the Minister of Health, Social Service and Public Safety dated the 25th of February, providing information regarding the look-back exercise of serious adverse incidents, which indicates that of the 1,417 serious adverse incidents reported during the 1st of January 2009 to the 31st of December 2013, there were 777 cases where a death was associated with the SAI, and of these, 18, which constitutes 2.3%, were reported to the coroner more than three days after the date. The letter sets out further details regarding the 18 cases and a number of initiatives that the Department of Health is currently taking forward to strengthen and enhance public assurance and scrutiny of the death certificate, uh, certification process. The initiatives include the rollout of a regional uh, mortality and mobility review system and the introduction of an independent medical reviewer similar to that being introduced in Scotland from May 2015, which would provide additional safeguards and assurances. <coughs> so, uh, members last week indicated that they, they wish to take some time to consider this. <coughs> Are members of a view of whether they're inclined to support the... We would be inclined to support the... 
MLBs. To support the Attorney General's yes. amendment. Yep. Yep. But I know Alban here that. Well, we <laughs> still have some concerns about it, but there's, you know, it, it's um, a situation in which there are good points in relation to what we're saying. And yet you have to weigh that against what the health people are saying. So anyway, we'll, we'll have to. We'll return to this, what we're, we're suggesting is out. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. So we'll yeah. I think the additional information is useful. Yeah. Yeah. I'll be somewhat reluctant. Um, I, I think that the health, the health service traditionally has had um, a sort to of cover up its where, where, where it has fallen down. And I do think that it has been in the process of change. It still hasn't got there, but it has been in the process of change and, and we'll have sought to encourage them down the route of more openness and transparency. Uh, because one can see with the, the likes of the O'Hara review just completed there, of the feelings of actually not being as open and honest and frank at the outset. The SAIs were set up as a learning process. That isn't a punishment process. It's where there may be something which is fairly minor as went wrong, maybe something which is very, very significant. But it is there to say, because you didn't do the following, that led to a, a worse outcome for this individual than would otherwise have been the case. So they shouldn't be negatively perceived. We want as much openness and honesty and frankness coming from our staff as possible. So I'm. <coughs> Somewhat reluctant if, it, if it's actually going to lead to people perhaps not being just as upfront as, as what they might otherwise be. Um, otherwise, we'll not have the, the learning that exists. But at the same time, wanting as much openness as possible will doing this extract it from it. And I'm not, I'm not convinced that it will. So I, I'm not, I'm not say, saying that the Attorney General is wrong in this one. But I'm not convinced that he's right either. So I'm, I, I'm, I'm not in a position where I can you know, be as affirmative. Could, could, could I just, just say there's a difference between SSIs and uh, the, uh, um, an accident report. An accident report is a piece of evidence that you can scrutinise. The SSI is a learning experience yeah. for the professionals involved in the situation. <coughs> That's what its original purpose was for. It was not to create an evidential basis. Uh, and that's the difference between the two. I would have an open mind on this. Uh, uh, I think others... It uh, came on the back of cold rain. You know, the Attorney General's concern and, and there was around 20 yes. deaths there. And some of them should have been reported. Mm -hmm. There's absolutely no doubt some of them should have been reported. But, 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 Chair, it's not but, necessarily... Pat, Patsy, the I'll come up. Sorry, sure. Patsy. Yeah. <clears throat> My one concern in all of this is whatever about the learning curve within hospitals, if information so far, which it clearly has, has been withheld or set to the one side and not provided to families or to the next of kin that should have been, and if what the Attorney General is doing will clarify that, that situation to give people what they require is openness how their loved one has passed away, be it child through to mum or dad or whatever. The um, only question we have to ask ourselves is if the situation at the moment is that that hasn't been 100% delivered, obviously you ask why not, but what's before us today is the can, what the Attorney General is proposing help deliver that. And while I have an open mind and fear at this stage more towards the, the latter, and that's the Attorney General's proposal to help yeah. people who are in difficult circumstances already establish the truth around the death of, of their loved one. Oh. Yeah, just to be clear, my understanding is is of it that the Attorney General could call on anything that he suspects he wants to have a look at. So it's not just adverse instance. It could be any death. Uh, and that's, uh, whilst I can see the rationale for that, there is this aspect of if he can call anything in, there could be a, a grip of fear go across the health service as to what we should actually make people aware of, write down, uh, record, uh, and it's that practice that I would worry would 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 ultimately diminish 
the transparency. So th whilst, I, whilst I think we all want to get to a position where there's more transparency, it's, it's what we, how we get there. Best vehicle to do. Yeah, and that, that's what I'm still there in. Right, well, look, we'll, we'll take this decision that the, the, the committee is a little bit minded in this and we will return to it. But again, if, if people can concentrate their minds maybe in the next number of days and we try to come to some for you, because of the fact that this is slightly different in the sense that the committee would have to take this forward, as the Attorney General is asking us to, I think some sort of uh, oh, decision no, 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 taken. No. Okay. We move on. See, just on the Sorry, yes. Mm. In relation to, to this amendment, <coughs> is there a possibility of a sunset clause? Yes. Can a sunset clause be written in this? No, in other words, you could review it I mean, no. every 12 months. We'll, we'll, we'll so get if it. it's overdone, then you can yeah. go. Or if the health department put themselves in that advanced position, you can say, hold on. Okay, well, we'll get the advice done in the next over. Okay. In other words, if we move on to the, then the proposed amendment by Mr. Wells. Um, refer members to tabs 27 to 30. Um, the amendment was proposed by Jim Wells. Initially, we took uh, evidence on it. The committee took evidence on it. Um, are, are members of the view that we should um, include views on that within our committee report? It would be useful to do that, given that I think the, the criticism the last time was that there wasn't any um, consultation on it. Now that there has been consultation yeah. on it, I'm presuming that it was brought forward by another member. Um, Just going to. Jim, continue this. Mr. Wells couldn't bring it forward, but I imagine that somebody else will. Um, so it might be useful to include the, the comments on it, the evidence section in the report, if members are happy enough to do that. Could make it a committee amendment. So desired. Yeah. No, well, it depends if, if there's a majority in the committee. Oh, no, of course, it, you know, yeah. understand that. Well, but it could be a committee amendment. Yeah. Whether, whether people support it or not, I do think we the committee should make comment because well, no, we, have, we have certainly yeah, looked no, at absolutely. it, we have consulted on it, uh, and it's not as if we're blind to it. Uh, right, well, look, we'll, we'll discuss that issue again then in our, in our mop up session um, about the different options that there are then for that. But I think as long as members are satisfied. Well, at this we, moment, we would be sympathetic to the amendment, yeah. but we haven't made a formal. Okay. Look, members, there will be a short meeting that will arrange for lunchtime on Tuesday the 11th of March to complete the informal consideration and proposed amendment. <laughs> um, and then formal consideration will take place on the 12th of March. So if members can make an effort to be at the, the meeting on the 11th, and if they can have a think about some of these issues that we haven't resolved yet, um, for that meeting it would be very useful. Uh, and for the 11th, would you be looking at an occasion if we bring amendments at that stage? Hopefully. Yeah. Okay. okay. Okay, members can move on then to agenda item 8, um, refer you to pages 203 to 230 of your meeting folders. Um, <coughs> just to remind members that at the meeting on the 12th of November, the committee agreed that it was content with the draft guidance from the Attorney General, Youth Justice Agency, <coughs> regarding the conditions of pension. Sure. Members, if we could just keep the noise down and concentrate a little bit to get through this so we get it finished. The committee subsequently agreed on the 28th of January that it was content with the proposed statutory rule that would bring the guidance into operation. That's your rule number 2015-50 was laid by the Attorney General on the 20th of February 2015 and subject to the negative resolution procedure. The statutory rule will come into operation on the 23rd of March 2015. There have been no changes to the policy content since the SL1 was submitted to the committee and the examiner of statutory rules has confirmed that he has no issues to raise with regard to the technical aspects of the rule. So if members are content, I'll put the formal question. That the Committee for Justice considered such a rule number 2015-50, the Attorney General's Human Rights Guidance, Youth Justice Agency Conditions of Detention Order, Northern Ireland 2015, and has no objection to the rule. Great. Move on to agenda item 9 then, with fair members to page 233 through to 252 of the meeting folders. Just to remind members at the meeting on the 10th of December, the Committee agreed that it was content with the draft guidance from the Attorney General for Probation Board of Northern Ireland. The committee subsequently agreed on the 28th of January that it was content with the proposed statutory <coughs> rule to bring the guidance into operation. The statutory rule number 2015-51 was laid by the Attorney General on the 20th of February 2015 as subject to the negative resolution procedure. The statutory rule will come into operation on the 23rd of March 2015. There have been no changes to the policy content since the SL1 was submitted to the committee and the examiner of such a rule confirmed that he has no issues to raise with regard to the technical aspects of the rule. So if members are content, I'll put the formal question. 
Will the Committee for Justice considered such your number 2015-51, the Attorney General's Human Rights Guidance Probation Board for Northern Ireland Order, Northern Ireland 2015, and has no objection to the rule. Great. Great. Okay, agenda items 10, 11, 12, and 13. Draft statutory rules relating to civil legal services and criminal legal aid. Refer you to uh, pages 254 through to 298 of the meeting folder. Uh, members will recall at the meeting on the 18th of February, the committee agreed that it was content to approve four draft affirmatory statutory rules to establish a procedure for appeals against decisions and applications for funding by civil legal services and provide for the establishment and composition of independent appeals panels. They provide for the disclosure of information which is furnished to the Department of Justice in connection with an individual seeking or receiving civil legal services. Provide for the disclosure of information which is furnished to the Department or any court in connection with the case of individuals seeking or receiving representation under a criminal, criminal aid certificate. And make provision for the circumstances in which cost protection will apply and when it will not apply on civil cases in which legal aid has been a feature. When approving the rules, the committee noted that there had been no changes to the policy content since the SL1s were submitted to the committee and the examiner statute rules had confirmed he had no issues to raise with regard to the technical aspects of the bill. Just to inform the committee that on the Monday the 23rd of February, the Department of Justice relayed the four statute rules in the business office, stating that it had made minor changes to each of the rules following a range of suggestions by the examiner of statute rules to tidy up the drafting. The changes are set out in the Department's letter of pages 255 to 258 of the meeting folder, and the Department has confirmed that there have been no policy changes. So given that the Department has relayed the rules, formal questions need to be put again, and we therefore have to um, do those in turn. So firstly, the Civil Legal Services Appeal Regulations. Can I ask members, are they content that the Committee for Justice considers draft such a rule SR the Civil Legal Services Appeal Regulations Northern Ireland 2015 and recommends that it be affirmed by the Assembly. Great. On the uh, Civil Legal Services Disclosure Information Regulations, again, I'll put the question that the Committee for Justice consider draft such a rule SR the Civil Legal Services Disclosure Information Regulations Northern Ireland 2015 and recommends that it be affirmed by the Assembly. Great. Okay, next one then, that the Committee for Justice consider draft statutory rule SR, the Criminal Legal Aid Disclosure of Information Rules Northern Ireland 2015, and recommends that be affirmed by the Assembly. Great. Great. And the Civil Legal Services Cost Protection Regulations, again, I put it to the Committee that the Committee for Justice consider draft statutory rule SR, the Civil Legal Services Cost Protection Regulations 2015, and recommends that it be affirmed by the Assembly. Great. Okay. Um, I can also get agreement from members that we write to the Department regarding the handling of these such rules to avoid in the future the need for the Committee to have to do it twice. <coughs> mm -hmm. I don't think it was particularly satisfactory, but anyhow, if we move on to agenda item 14, I refer members to pages 300 through to 309 of your meeting folders. The Committee considered a correspondence from the Committee of the First and Deputy First Minister requesting a report from each statutory committee on EU priorities for 2015 and the work it's undertaken in relation to its 2014 European priorities and agreed that the draft report should be prepared for consideration. The draft report is at pages 301 to 309 of the meeting folder. There were no relevant justice priorities highlighted by the Assembly's Research and Information Service from the European Commission's annual work programme for 2015. Therefore, the report indicates that the Committee will continue to focus on the current work streams, the European Commission's strategic guidelines and priorities from last year. Uh, are members content with the draft report setting out the Committee EU priorities for 2015 and the work undertaken on the Committee's 2014 European priorities, uh, or does anyone wish any changes? Are we content? Yep. Yep. Yes. Okay. Um, the agreed report will be sent to the OFMDFM Committee and the Department of Justice to enable officials to provide information on the key priorities as and when is necessary. So agenda item 15 then is correspondence. There are 12 items of correspondence, pages 315 through 362. I can just uh, refer to a few of them. Item 1, page 315 is a letter from the Department regarding REC widows' uh, pensions. <coughs> the Minister of Justice intends to extend Section 30 of the Public Service Pensions Act 2014 <coughs> to include those few surviving widows in the 1949 scheme, given the Assembly's original intention that, it was, uh, that all police widows should retain or have reinstated their pensions upon no. marriage. The necessary amendment will be made using the Police Pension Regulations 2015. So that's for noting, unless anyone has any other comments to make. 
Uh, yeah, you, uh, we rem sorry, on this, on that one specific or any in correspondence? This specific one. Sorry, sorry, no. We'll come back to you. Yeah, okay. Item 2, page 317, is a response from the Department in relation to the Police Pension Regulation 2015. The Department has provided the further information request with the Committee on whether it's possible to ease the monetary penalty if a police officer chooses to retire before the age of 60 by varying or amending uh, the actuarial deductions, and whether this can be incorporated within the current draft regulations or would require a change to primary legislation. The Department has indicated that the police officers may retire before the age of 60 with uh, actuarial reduction. Any change to this or the rate of actuarial reduction would have to be met within the scheme cost envelope and could involve either an increase in all members' contribution rates or a reduction in the benefit accru uh, accrual rates. Any proposal to alter the actuarial impact of early retirement would require detailed <coughs> actuarial uh, analysis, followed by a targeted consultation required under the legislation. While it would not be possible to amend the current draft regulations, this could be taken forward at any time uh, following uh, completion of the required process by way of secondary legislation. The Department has now laid the police pension regulations in the Assembly, and the statutory rule will be placed on the agenda for further consideration once the examiner's comments on the technical aspects have been received. Again, this is just for noting. We will return to this issue once uh, it comes back to the committee. What, 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 um, I mean, what options are there arising out of that response? Is it, uh, on one reading of it, is that you could, in fact, uh, revisit the uh, actuarial deductions in secondary legislation post the, um, uh, the uh, draft regulations before us, uh, post them being actually implemented in the, in the Assembly. Uh, is, is that a correct reading, Chair? Yeah. So uh, w we, as a committee, could in fact uh, look at this again after the regulations come into effect. Right. So if there was the political will around the table to have a look at this, then we, you know, we'd, we 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 can do that without any. Uh, penalty or anything of that nature being imposed uh, uh, by Westminster, uh, right? <coughs> um, the, the, the other point I wanted to make about it was this, that um, in relation to uh, the four or five percent yep. actuarial deduction, uh, I, I, didn't, I, I don't see that anywhere in the regulations, and indeed, it seems to me that this is something which um, uh, has simply been speculated upon by the relevant uh, authorities, including the Treasury. So, um, perhaps whenever uh, there's an indication as to, by the scheme manager as to what the actuarial deduction would actually be, then we could look at that. Uh, and see if that can be ameliorated in some way. And uh, whilst there's reference to a uh, uh, an increase in, in um, contributions by police officers or a reduction in benefits in other aspects of the pension fund, it, it could well be that uh, the uh, Department of Finance here could make up a shortfall as well. Uh, remembering, uh, Chair, that uh, the pension will not come into effect for at least uh, 10 years, if not longer. Okay. So we'll, I'm quite sure have a, a further discussion <laughs> with you once we go back to the, the, the committee. It seems to be a regular feature. But it would have been useful had we known all this during the course of these discussions, because uh, none of this information was made available to us uh, as a committee. Okay. I draw the members' attention to item 4, pages 324. It's a response from the Department in relation to levels of serious crime in Northern Ireland and the PFG Commitment 54. The Department has provided statistical information on how Schedule 1, Part 2 of the Serious Crime Act 2007 as amended and Schedule 1 of the Criminal Justice Northern Ireland Order 2008 as, amendment, as it amended identify a range of offences which are defined as serious within the meaning of the specific legislation. Further information from PSN on the number of recorded crimes for each crime class from 2010-11 to 2013-14. The Department has also highlighted that there is no single definition of what constitutes serious crime. 
So can we get agreement to request clarification from the Department on how it measures progress on the achievement of PFG Commitment 54, reduced levels of serious crime, given the lack of a definition for serious crime? Yeah. Interesting enough, that's a curious one, so it be interesting to uh, get a response on that. Item 5, uh, page 330, is a copy of the response from the Department to the public petition on the withdrawal of funding to Railway Street uh, Addiction and Rehabilitation Unit in Ballymena. Members will recall we've had a discussion about this on a number of occasions. <coughs> the response indicates the Northern, the Northern Trust has secured additional funding that will maintain this initiative until 31st of March 2015, and that in January the Department was prepared to support an assets recovery community scheme application to a maximum of 200000 Provided the money could be spent to the 31st of March 2015, the Department is also prepared to guarantee a further two years' funding from the Assets Recovery Community Scheme with a value range of 50 to 60,000 and support any further bids, which would be assessed in competition with any other bids. So, this is just a note, unless anybody. Yeah, yeah, just to cut, it would be remiss of me not to comment uh, on this, Chair. Uh, whilst it's not as it was, it is still. Definitely better than what it could have been and, sh and would have been if we, they hadn't secured any funding. Uh, and the, of course, the Department of Health has done a lot on this issue too. Uh, again, it is a temporary measure, and I think that s somewhere along the line, the Department of Justice will have to take work that these people do more seriously than they have uh, this year. Uh, this is what we should be doing and doing more of in order to save, make savings and then get better outcomes. But I'm glad to say that at this point in time, the people who work in this service and the users uh, who enjoy this service uh, are much happier than they were a number of weeks ago. So again, I, I, I welcome this letter and this news of additional funding. Any comments on another piece of correspondence? Let me move on to yes. yeah, I uh, just want yes. to uh, draw to your attention the um, uh, the letter from the Association of Personal Injury Lawyers mm -hmm. in relation to the fatal accidents of the Ireland Order 77 and the bereavement payment, uh, statutory bereavement. Uh, and that figure uh, is currently set at 11,800. That's the case where somebody dies um, and uh, uh, the, the immediate relatives, uh, usually the spouse, uh, is compensated for the death. Uh, that's called a bereavement payment. That is quite low at the moment. It's higher in England, and the Department uh, of uh, Finance and Personnel have not increased that amount. And there is good cause uh, for that amount to, in fact, be increased. And I think we should consider it. Not my chair. <laughs> Uh, uh, we should consider that and end our wait, hopefully, uh, to see uh, an increase in it. Okay. We'll, we'll be getting a response back from the department, so after yeah, we get a response yes. back, we, okay. we can then consider what we wish to, to, to bring officials up. Okay. Right then item 16, then Chairman's Business. Item 1, correspondence from the Bar Council regarding proposed cut legal aid funding. Refer members of 364 to 392 of the meeting folder. Chief Executive of the Bar Council has written providing a copy of sample letters from practitioners in the lower courts to the Minister of Justice regarding the impact of the Department's proposals to reduce access funding and entitlement to legal aid. In the Minister's comments that he was not aware of any barristers earning less than minimum wage. The Chief Executive will welcome an opportunity for members of uh, the Young Bar Association to meet uh, to discuss the issue further. I have indicated that I am willing to meet with them. Um, Raymond is as well. So, if any other committee members wish to do so, they'll arrange a date and uh, email around committee members if they want to, to come along to that meeting. It might be useful to do so. Item two is correspondence from the Law Society regarding a Legal Aid Members Forum event, referred to page 393 of your folders. The Law Society has written to invite committee members to a Legal Aid Members Forum event, which is organising for either the 26th or 27th of March to discuss forthcoming developments in relation to the provision of publicly funded legal services in Northern Ireland and in particular working practices, service offered to clients and the impact of the Minister's most recent proposals. Speakers will be practising solicitors in legal aid and the President of the Law Society will set out the position of the Society. The Law Society also indicates that the Justice Committee Chair or Deputy Chair can be facilitated if they wish to speak. Um, I am happy enough to take part in that, um, <coughs> Deputy Chair is as well. If any other members wish to take part once we get the date finalised, 
uh, we will again send a notification out to members if they wish to, to go along to that. Um, agenda item 17 is any other business? So if anybody has anything to raise, I think Sammy had to. Did I raise an, an issue? Yeah. Um, sure, I hope it's uh, appropriate. Um, over this past year or so, I have had a number of my constituents come to me who are taxi drivers. Uh, once they apply to renew their, their licence through Access NI, um, which doesn't seem to be a problem, but once it gets to the PSNI, it's held up. Uh, example, last week, and this, this has been uh, recurring, last week a taxi driver who had um, put his application in November access NI and they, um, they they passed it on to PSNI on the eighth of December and the the guy's license of um, renewal and he's now out of work for nearly four weeks and certainly the taxi company wrote to the um, the PSNI and they said would you show us evidence of financial hardship? You know, four weeks, some of the mortgage um, and this has happened far too often. In fact, when I was uh, speaking to someone from the policing board, yeah. um, Gordon Dunn um, had a similar issue in, in North Down. So I'm just wondering, there's, there's some, some somebody that we could write to. I, I have, have, have asked um, Rob Newton to raise it at the policing board, okay. but it's it's unacceptable yeah. because people are, are uh, losing their livelihoods, but for some reason or other, worse, uh, and it doesn't seem to be any. Technical problem. It yeah. just seems to be just very slow. Right. Even though I have uh, much more police myself, senior police officers, at this point in time, now get into five weeks, search someone, can I go out and do yeah. business? And then there's a technical. Put a gun license around five days, apparently. Yeah. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> I'm happy enough that we'll write to the department on this. Sorry, I presume it's the yeah. same issue that yeah. I remember yeah. a few weeks ago raising the issue. Threw away last week, but <clears throat> I had it. I have a couple of three cases around this, and they're really delaying and delaying and delaying. And they, their turnaround time supposed to be 60 days for yes, that. Right. And the maximum. Uh, but there's 900 people waiting more than 60 days. Apparently, that's the latest. 900. 900. And there's a big backlog going way back to to last year. So that's definitely an issue. Would be probably helpful, chair, if we yeah. the officials or more importantly the police charge. Yeah. I'll do this. Yeah. Come before the committee. Okay, well, look, what we'll do is we'll write to them, we'll get the most updated figures, and then we'll get a response, then we'll try to facilitate that in the, the next number of weeks. Okay. okay, members? Okay, agenda item 18 is date, time, and place. The next meeting will be on Tuesday, the 10th of March at 12.30. Okay. Remember, it's Tuesday we're meeting. Yes, sir.